Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is August 2nd, 2023. We are live today here to answer the very important question. Joseph, you know, was Joseph Smith a human trafficker and or was he involved in human sex trafficking? To provide a tiny bit of context uh, today, uh, there has been a lot of conversation in the United States and in Mormonism about human trafficking. And uh, I think I can say up front that everyone involved in today's episode is against uh, human trafficking, is against child trafficking, is against um, anything that's coercive and abusive and that harms any human and especially that harms children. I think that's one of the main reasons we're doing this episode. Um, and uh, But while we're at it, there are so many um, faithful uh, Latter-day Saints or Mormons who particularly seem outraged at the idea of, um, you know, child sex trafficking happening in the world, which is great. Um, but uh, what what that does is it reminds me of, uh, you know, the time that I read the Nauvoo Expositor, which was the newspaper article published by William Law, a member of the First Presidency, where he, uh, back in Nauvoo in 1844, where he talked about um, basically Joseph and other missionaries going to Europe and bringing young women over to Nauvoo to then be kind of brought into polygamous marriages. And for years and years and years, that's been on my mind, uh, does that qualify as sex trafficking? And uh, and so while we have, n I don't think any of us on today's panel have any interest in sort of like making Joseph Smith this arbitrary punching bag where we accuse him of every bad thing that's going on, I think we're asking a legitimate question today and and that is was Joseph Smith and you know was Joseph Smith's behavior in Nauvoo would it qualify under today's standards for human trafficking? And um, we want to be thoughtful and uh, precise as as we can about this question. And so what I've done is I've brought on three people who I really admire and respect in terms of their intellect. And, uh, and so that's who we have on today. We have Julia uh, from Analyzing Mormonism. Julia also is well known for uh, doing the shorts, uh, the TikTok and Instagram and, and Facebook and YouTube shorts here on Mormon Stories Podcast. Hey, Julia, thanks for joining Hi. us today. Hi. <laughs> um, Julia, anything else you want to, you want to say uh, by way of introduction about yourself? About myself? Yeah. Um, no, not really. I think that was like I'm. I do analyzing Mormonism on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram. So, and I have a web page. So, yeah. And and uh, you you are starting to publish uh, out of date books, and I think yes. you are going to be publishing a for a, a printed version of the Nauvoo Expositor. Is that right? Yeah, we have. It's not up yet, but it's coming up soon. This is the printed version. It's a really long newspaper. It's only four pages. But it's if you put it in book format, it's significantly bigger. But yeah, it'll be audio, print, it'll be ebook, so it'll be up soon. So and when it's ready, kinda, where do where do people find it? Can just you give Amazon, them the URL? Wherever, yeah, yeah, it'll be it'll be on our company's website and then on my personal website with the store. So we can. And what's the what's the name? Do you have a name for that website yet? Yeah, there's a it's Adina Publishers, and then they're at the bottom of the page. Spell that. Mormon, spell that. Spell oh, that. Oh, e d i n a publishers dot com. Okay. Okay. And then at the bottom of the page, there's the Mormon studies thing you can click to show all the books that we're working on and then where to purchase them. And then on my Analyzing Mormonism website, there's a store like hash, hashtag, not hash, backslash store. And then you can okay. buy the books there as well, too. So and the reason why, you know, I've been admiring, Julia, your Mormon history chops and research on your TikTok channel for some time. And so when I needed someone to do a deep dive into this question in a scholarly way that would be perceived as, or that would be experienced as professional and thoughtful and careful, I thought of you. And so I asked you to do the yeoman's work in preparing and researching for this episode. So thank you for that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was was it fun to to do this research or, or so, painful? Well, or? So, so I grew up in the church and like asking the question of Joseph Smith, this man that I admired, if he was uh, involved in human trafficking, like that was really devastating. And then to see this 
or not the question, but the answers that I was finding, which is what we're presenting today, was like just seeing a person that I thought I knew in a different light, if that makes sense. And like, I like the way, what you were saying, like, I don't want to paint Joseph as a villain. I don't want to focus on him as, as a villain. I, I want to more focus on the women and their experiences than on anything else. So they're, they're the ones that are important to me and sharing their stories. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for being willing to do uh, the research uh, for this episode or the, the, the main research. And of course, we have back with us from across the pond, Nemo the Mormon of the Nemo the Mormon YouTube channel. Hey, Nemo. Hey, I think today's going to tell us I'm one of the only Mormons that didn't flee to America. Even Sam's <laughs> run away to America. What's that about? <laughs> Well, Nemo, um, th th this is an issue that's personal for you as well. Do you want to yeah. just talk about that really, really quickly? Yeah, uh, it's it's ultimately, I've just been reading the story of a village called Downham. And, and to my understanding, what I've been told by others is that Downham was a village where there was a lot of preaching done up in Lancashire. And so many people left from the village. The village was almost left destitute without people for a long time by these Mormon missionaries who came in and took everyone away. Um, and recently, in, in the past maybe 10, 20 years, the church paid £100,000, I think, to have the, the village's church organ fixed you know their their pipe organ fixed uh, as a way to try and kind of uh atone fix bridges yeah sort of thing build bridges with with the the town because you know whole villages have been converted to mormonism and disappeared from the uk so um it is it is very kind of personal to me the history of the church here uh, because so many Brits went to America to build up the church as we know at one point there was more Brits in the church than there were Americans yeah right beautiful. in the early history so well, we, people always love having you on Nemo and please do subscribe to Nemo, the Mormon YouTube channel, check it out and support Nemo. The, the fourth and final person that we're having on today's panel is Samantha Shelley of Zelf on the Shelf YouTube channel. Please support Zelf on the Shelf as well. And Samantha, I'm sure you could summarize better than me why this particular topic is personal to you. <laughs> cause, cause I joined Mormonism and moved to America. Yeah. As a, as a, as a young woman, right? Yeah, and I mean, I uh, obviously did not go through what the women back in Joseph and Brigham's day went through, but uh, yeah, I suppose there's a similarity. But thankfully, I wasn't uh, unbeknownst to me going into a polygamous system and then being forced to be the fourth wife to some old guy. So I had it good. Yeah. Well, we're really, really glad to have you back on Mormon Stories podcast, and please support Zelf on the Shelf. It's an it's amazing content. And Samantha, you you and Tanner have covered this issue explicitly as well, correct? Yeah, uh, we. Sorry about my cat burning. No, the cats welcome. The cats are always welcome. <laughs> we did a live recently where we dove into a lot of different contemporary news articles uh, about what uh, journalists were seeing in Utah uh, under Brigham's rule. And it was, it was quite a bit worse than I thought in terms of uh, how much these women and men from Europe were not told what they were going into. And then they're arriving in Utah and there's like guards standing with guns and then bishops coming in the first night and taking the women that they want. And then those women have to be that bishop's fourth wife. Like it was just all uh, very harrowing to have to absorb, but yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. And that's what we're here to dig into today. So without any further ado, Julia, you're going to be the main guide for today, but we're going to ask Nemo and Samantha to jump in at will. And I think we're going to start with the first slide. Let's define uh, what human trafficking is. Go ahead, Julia. Yeah. So the we're talking about, specifically, we're talking about sex trafficking with Joseph Smith, but I wanted to point out that there are two different types of human trafficking. And one of them is forced labor, and it's sometimes referred to as labor trafficking. And it encompasses a range of activities involved when a person uses force, fraud, or coercion to exploit the labor or services of another person. So, like, we'll see in the Nauvoo Expositor and other places that this was happening in the early church, I, except my research today is mostly on the sex trafficking with these with his polygamous wives and the polygamous wives that he, the polygamous unions that he authorized. So we're talking about both. or we're, Well, both happened, but we're talking about one of them. So. And honestly, I wanted, I mean, I think this episode would have been most aptly named, did Joseph Smith engage in sex trafficking? I've worried that that was a little too scandalous, but also I worried that the YouTube algorithms would punish us for using that word. So we, we, we um, neutralized it a little bit. 
I don't know if that was good or bad, but this yeah, really is about sex, sex trafficking. Yeah. But it's still true because sex trafficking is a form of human trafficking. So, you right, know, right. We're, still, yeah. we're still living up to the promise of the thumbnail. Don't you worry, viewers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Julia, tell us what uh, sex trafficking is then specifically. Okay. So there's, there's a few different definitions of sex trafficking. So sex trafficking is a form of human trafficking, like we said, and it is an, act, a, an action or practice of a transporting people from one country or area to another for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Yet there are other um, definitions as well. Um, it's been called a more, um, it's been called a form of modern slavery because of the way the victims are forced into these acts non-consensually. And then sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing or soliciting of a person for the purpose of commercial sex act in which a commercial sex act sex act is induced by force fraud or coercion so so i think it's there's a broader definition than just having people be taken in from from great britain or england or wherever it's just it's the forcing or the coercion of people to do these um, commercial sex act acts so it can happen oh. domestically is what you're saying you don't right. have to cross international it, lines exactly, for it to yeah. count okay yeah I mean, it could happen in your own home, right? If your parent. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. All right. Um, and I and I am interested in, in making sure to explore that notion of force or coercion, because I think there's hard coercion where people are like chained and forced, enslaved, but then there, there's also undue influence that I imagine can come into play here as well. Are we going to yeah. be covering that? Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk okay. about that. All right. <clears throat> Let's jump to the next slide. Um, there we go. The basics of sex trafficking. Okay. So how it begins. So people in sex trafficking situations almost always know and even trust or love their traffickers. Trafficking Traffickers target vulnerable people. And if you're a person who's coming in from England to join the Mormon Church, you're a vulnerable person. Um, or even these young people who are just shy of 15 years old. Um, sometimes they offer material support, a place to live, clothing, a chance to get rich quick. And other times they offer love, emotional support, or a sense of belonging. And with the Tim Ballard stuff, um, these stories of kidnapping victims and forcing them into these th these sexual acts, this is that's very uncommon. That's not very usual. It's usually, like we said, people that you know and trust. And you could even add that these people can come, the, they can be the prophet of your church who can do the trafficking. So, And that's one of the things that... Um, is tricky is again, who isn't against other than sex traffickers, who's not against sex trafficking. But, but when we focus on the kidnapping of people and forcing them in, may, maybe I hear what you're saying is the cost is we ignore other far more prevalent types of trafficking. Is that right? Exactly. exactly. And when your focus is on that, on kidnapping individuals or people who have been kidnapped, you're losing your, you're not protecting these other people as well who are in their own homes or in the homes of their neighbors or their friends. You're not helping these people. And I think it's always, it's, it's very often the case that um, the more overt, the more sensationalist uh, versions of events or problems tend to make their way to the fore. They make their way into the newspapers, they make their way into the media, um, whereas the more subtle versions of things like sex trafficking maybe aren't as well covered. So, yeah, yeah, someone gets stolen from their home in the middle of the night. It's all dramatic. Uh, yeah, people are covering that left, right, and center. The person whose parent takes them away somewhere, no one even knows. All right, very good. All right, let's go to the next slide, the basics of sex trafficking. Who are the traffickers, Julia? Okay, so the traffickers come from all genders, races, ethnicities, and walks of life. They could be anyone. In sex trafficking situations, they may be an intimate partners or spouse of the victim, family members, friends, or benefactors, or business acquaintances and bosses, and like I said, it can even also be the profit of your church. So, I mean, in theory, it could be, I guess what we're going to be asking is, can it be clergy? Can clergy sex traffic? Yeah. Right? Like why, why not? Like it can be anyone. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, and Samantha, I'll invite you to jump in at any point as well to any comment you want to make. I'm not going to ask everybody to jump in because that just takes too long to, to, to run the rounds. So please jump in sure. anytime. Yeah. Um, okay, so who are the victims then, uh, Julia? Okay, so the victims can be anyone also. So these are people who are generally have greater needs. These They can include people in poverty or unstable housing situations, as well as people with a history of trauma or addiction. And because of his current and historic discrimination and inequality, people of color, immigrants, and people who identify as LGBTQ are more likely to be exploited 
for these vulnerabilities and face trafficking. And uh, and and we we've mentioned the UK or Great Britain quite a bit already, but but I, there's probably some sort of socioeconomic historical context to provide about what was going on in Europe, which includes Scandinavia um, and other parts of Europe you know, during the early 19th century. Nemo, is that anything you would want to speak to in terms of well, famines or, you know, socioeconomic I mean, dynamics? People were coming out of the villages into the cities. Uh, the country was industrializing. Um, some of the newspaper articles I was reading in the lead up to this, um, as only Brits can, they made a lot of this issue about class. They talked about how the people that were leaving to join Mormonism were of a lower class, were of a lower intellect, all these sorts of things. I wouldn't want to cast those aspersions myself, but it was certainly something that was being talked about at the time was um, more vulnerable people, people with less world experience, people that were in more difficult situations, in worse paying jobs. You know, work situations, we've gone from agriculture to industry and industry is where you start to get children running underneath cotton looms to pick up drop threads and you get chim chimney sweeps and all that Oliver Twist nonsense that you know Americans love to talk about but uh, this this was a problem you know uh, people were living in worse conditions than their ancestors had because as people were industrialized it became about an economy of people not about you know people's welfare so much okay so it's so it, it's fair to say that that many of the women who were trafficked were were economically vulnerable Mm -hmm. Fair? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So let's go to why don't victims just leave? This was a this was a narrative that was advanced during the Elizabeth Smart um, sort of trial uh, or uh, so, sort of situation or case. Talk, talk about that, Julia. Yeah, Elizabeth's a great example. She wasn't traffic, but yeah, she's a great example of why they don't just leave. So yeah. Um, so in many cases, people in sex trafficking situations do not see themselves as victims while they are being trafficked. They have been so expertly manipulated or groomed that they believe they are making their own choice to engage in commercial sex. These emotional ties are so powerful as being held in handcuffs or behind bars. People in sex trafficking situations may, may well also depend on their traffickers for physical needs like money or shelter. They may face threats against them or their families or violence if they complain or try to leave. And you can, can we'll, we'll show a lot of these in, in the upcoming slides. So, so if, if, if the people are economically vulnerable to their captors mm -hmm. or physically for, for housing, for money, et cetera. Which is what makes me worry about, I, I don't want to take us down this tangent, so please don't let me take us down this tangent, but I, I, it makes me worried about missionaries. The idea that missionaries have their passport taken away from them, they have their right to move freely taken away from them, screams trafficking by these I have definitions. Heard people, I have heard people mention mention that. Yeah. Um, maybe but, that's a, a good topic for another time. Indeed. All right. So how do people get out of sex trafficking situations, Julia? Okay. So every story is different. What they have in common is resilience. Survivors come to the understanding that they want to leave the situation. Then they fight to get out. Sometimes they get help from service providers or anti-trafficking organizations, but the concept of rescuing adult sex trafficking victims is misleading and sometimes dangerous. Survivors mostly re survivors rescue themselves. Okay, and that's important, why? It's important because these people, I guess it's important for education purposes and it's important for people, these other organizations who are saying that they're helping and they're saying that they're rescuing people when in reality, Maybe they're not as well or not being as successful. There, there's just a lot of different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So how do we, before we jump into Joseph Smith, uh, you felt like it was important to mention up did, front yeah. how we reduce and prevent sex trafficking. Yeah, because the answer I don't think is to just go in the Congo and, and break down doors. I don't think that's actually the answer. But there are there is an answer here. So let me read this just for this purpose. Just So human trafficking doesn't happen in a vacuum. It is the end result of other in, 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 excuse me, inequities in our society and our economic system that make people vulnerable to the enticements of trafficking. So while, while prosecuting traffickers and seeking justice for survivors is vital, it is not enough by itself to end trafficking. To reduce trafficking at the massive scale of the, at the, massive scale of the problem, we need to work together as a society to increase supports and services for vulnerable people in change conditions like homelessness, family violence, poverty and discrimination that makes people vulnerable to the lure of trafficking. So the more we can help people who are in hard situations, people who are like me and identify as lesbian or gay or queer 
or people of color, this is what welcoming them and help, helping to stop discrimination is what's going to help stop stop human trafficking. Beautiful. So the next slide is interesting one. It's asking the question, was Joseph Smith a polygamist? I'm, I, uh, I think I know why you're including this, but why don't you go ahead and tell us? Because for many people, that's a foregone conclusion, but maybe not for all. <laughs> right. And I've had people argue with me, too, that um, it was legal in Joseph Smith's time, but it's not. It's not legal. Um, but yeah, people have asked the question, was Joseph Smith even a polygamist? And the reason I put this, the picture up there is from Mormonism Live. It's from their episode. And so if you go watch that, they break down the evidence and they talk about it. But if you go to the next slide, then there. So what what RFM did is he took the Nauvoo Expositor and he took the Revelation for DNC 132 and he compared them. And these people who read the Nauvoo Expositor, which was published just before Joseph was killed, they are quoting directly from this revelation. So Joseph Smith, this revelation existed during Joseph Smith's lifetime. And that tells us that Joseph Smith was indeed a polygamist. Yeah. And I'll just add, I recorded a special episode. So do check out Mormonism Live for that episode. I also did a good solid two hours with RFM where we went into depth. And I really believe we have we have destroyed, RFM has destroyed the notion that Joseph Smith was was not a polygamist. I think it's dead. And I, I agree. And, yes. and and watch for that in the coming week. Uh it it will be will be epic. Um so uh yeah, let's have none of that nonsense. And then you've gone ahead and listed all of Joseph Smith's polygamous wives here. Yeah, this is just sort of setting the stage of Joseph Smith's polygamy. So he married um eleven women who were already married, eighteen who were single, and four who were widows. So this just is just all the women and we will be talking about a few of them in this in the circum in the circumstances of being human trafficked and so, this list is from uh oh, yeah, todd compton's from in sacred loneliness here on screen for your viewing pleasure there you go and so total and total wives julia um so I, what i what is what is that 35 or something um, 35 known wives to joseph smith yeah and there's more like like fawn brody adds more there are other ones who add more but this is just going from todd compton's list and it, it seems like what you're doing in these slides is kind of trying to neutralize what some of the immediate arguments are going to be that Joseph Smith wasn't a polygamist. And then the next one that's very, very common is, well, maybe he was a polygamist, but sex wasn't involved, right? Exactly. Yeah. So in the Book of Mormon itself, it says, it tells us that the only reason why someone, why God would command polygamy is to raise up seed. For He says, for there shall not any man be among you, save it have one wife and concubines, he shall have none. For I will say the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me. I will command my people, otherwise they shall hearken unto these things. So only only for the purpose of having children. So which means if there's polygamy, you're going to have intimacy. Yeah. And then historians today also say that this is the case, that Joseph, they said that they claim that Joseph Smith had sexual relations with some of his wives. And my question would then be, why not all of his wives? And then I also wanted to point out something that I think is interesting is that Polygamy doesn't actually increase the number of children in the community. All polygamy does is increase the number of children for one person. So like Brigham Young had, I can't remember the exact numbers, 54 wives and then 58 children. So like, or something like that. So the average child per woman is one. So, but if, if Brigham had left these women alone, they could have had five children per husband. Like they would have increased the number of children immensely. And so, it, so I just thought that was an interesting thing to point out. So like, why would God command polygamy when in reality, more kids come if there isn't polygamy? So anyway. And it's not, and it's not just the Book of Mormon, but the Doctrine and Covenants makes this point as well, yeah, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Nima, do you want to talk about this one? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, so Doctrine and Covenants 132.63 says, But if one or either of the ten virgins, after she is espoused, shall be with another man, she has committed adultery, and shall be destroyed. For they are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth, according to my commandment, and to fulfill the promise which was given by my father before the foundation of the world, in the eternal worlds, that they may bear the souls of men. For herein is the work of my father continued, that he may be glorified." So what does that say, Nemo? That says that if you're going to be getting into polygamy, you better be doing it to have kids, because that is the point. Yeah, and and those polygamy apologists who try and claim Joseph never pra never had sex with his polygamous wives, they never can answer, you know, 
why would why would every prophet from Brigham Young to John Taylor and beyond have sex with with their polygamous wives? But but we would want to give Joseph a pass and claim that he didn't. Uh, why why would there be an exception there? Nobody has uh, an explanation for that. Um, in addition to the fact that that many of the wives themselves on multiple occasions testified under sworn affidavit that uh, that that they did um, you know know Joseph in in the flesh in the very deed so to speak. Um, we, we know that's true, I, correct? I think part of the problem that comes up is the euphemisms like you were kind of alluding to there. There's this hangover from from my country people and Sam's country people of, of not naming these things as we see them and using euphemisms to describe them. So a lot of what we're going to see later is people saying the transaction or uh, or, or this and that. Knowing. As, you know, yeah, the, the knowing. Um, lying with. Mm -hmm. you know, or these euphemisms that no one's going to out and out say that they were having sex because in that time you wouldn't say that sort of thing. And also Joseph was very determined to keep his polygamy secret. He was denying it his whole life, whereas Brigham and the prophets that did have uh, known children with their polygamous wives that, you know, they were out and proud about it. But Joseph was uh, openly telling the church he wasn't practicing polygamy when the church itself now admits he had like 34 wives. Right. Okay. It makes sense that he'd be a bit careful about the baby making. Absolutely. Okay, this is great. So uh, so we know that Joseph Smith had sex with his polygamous wives. The next slide has to do with the term polyandry, which was a term that was brand new to me when I was in my early 30s and investigating, going down the, the Mormon history rabbit hole, so to speak. Tell us about Dan Vogel and Joseph Smith and other men's wives, uh, Julia. Yeah. Yeah, so the reason I had this slide in here is because I didn't want to showcase his relationships with every one of these women, but it's we're doing a podcast on human trafficking or on sex trafficking specifically. So I went ahead and added the, that information anyway. But in case you want to see the evidence for Joseph Smith having sexual relationships with these women, go to Dan Vogel's video, Joseph Smith and Other Men's Wives, and he does a really good job of showing the evidence for these relationships. And then also I talk about Todd Compton's book, In Sacred Loneliness, where he goes through really great beautiful detail about all these women and, and their relationships with Joseph Smith. So, so those two things I would say, go there to find that evidence. I, I suspect that one of the reasons for Joseph choosing to marry other men's wives is that if a pregnancy emerged, it, Joseph wouldn't be suspected for it. Mm. It would just be assumed that it was the husband um, you know, not not some single young woman getting pregnant. Is that? Is I there... thought of that angle. That's a that's a good idea. That's a good thought. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these a lot of these women that were already married, they were married to men who were active in the church, had served multiple missions. Some of them, good standing with the church. Only I think only a couple of wives had struggles with their husbands. Anyway, that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so yeah, I, I agree with that. That he would marry women already married to cover up if they mm. were to have children. Okay, and let's talk about another polygamy defense, which is it was spiritual wifery, and and spiritual wifery is different than celestial marriage. Yeah, so I tend to use the same term, like just all of these terms, to mean the same thing. So, yeah, like sorry. to me, to me, it's not these aren't marriages because none of them are legal, and none of them are, or even very few were known by even Emma. So, so I tend to use these, but Nemo thought it was a really good idea to to separate them out so that we understand each other better. So spiritual wifery is marrying, again, this is not legal, marrying women secretly without the authorization of Joseph Smith. And then celestial marriage and polygamy is marrying women secretly with the authorization of Joseph Smith under his direction. So, so sometimes I might use the wrong term, but what I mean is the ones authorized by Joseph Smith, because that's what we're talking about today. So what I mean is the celestial marriage and polygamy and not spiritual wifery. Got it. Excellent. Yeah. I think it's okay. very important because that's what uh, Bennett gets accused of is spiritual wifery. And it was Joseph used this, this invented this idea that Bennett was basically doing exactly what he was doing. But it's like, no, 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 that's spiritual wifery. That's wrong. You can't do that. And that was his way of kind of offering up a sacrifice to the other people and saying, no, this is wrong. Well, we're going to distance ourselves from uh, polygamy. See, look, we're persecuting a guy who's doing basically exactly what Joseph's doing. And Nemo, when you say Bennett, you're referring to John C. Bennett. Mm -hmm. who John C. Was... Bennett, yeah helped help Joseph Smith establish Nauvoo. Mm -hmm. um, and it almost seemed, honestly, it almost seemed like Joseph was secretly practicing polygamy 
and he would tell a certain number of men about it. But if they got caught or if they started practicing it in a way that Joseph didn't like, he would denounce them for, um, you know, for spiritual wifery while continuing to practice yeah, you know his his own sexual and that that um, further you know, relationships further solidifies Joseph's cover because then he can be seen publicly to be denouncing people who are engaging in this sort of um, polyamory, polyandry, whatever is going on. He can say, "Well, no, 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 we don't do that." Look, see, every time we find someone doing it, we get rid of them. See, look, um, so he can offer these people up as sacrifices to the persona of Mormonism. Got it. All right, so Julia, you now are going to take us through a slide that tries to connect all the, connect all this, which is basically saying, can polygamy, you know, how should we think about polygamy through the lens of sex trafficking, even though the slide maybe says it differently? Yeah, so I, so I went through a lot of the definitions and the circumstances of sex trafficking, and I just wanted to overlay it with the polygamy. So these women did not see themselves as victims. They believed that they were making their own choice to engage or to become married to him. They depended on Joseph not only for money and shelter in a lot of cases, but for the salvation of their inter eternal souls and at the the souls of their families. These women were these women faced threats against them and their families if they did not accept Joseph. And I also wanted to point out that another form of human trafficking, another definition, is sexual sexual exploitation, domestic servitude, and forced marriage. Yeah. So for me, the question is: Did Joseph Smith, as someone who claimed to be God's soul, you know, voice and mouthpiece and prophet on the earth. Did he use undue influence to coerce these women into polygamous marriages? Um, were they super vulnerable and did that make it worse? And uh, um, yeah, w w you know, and, and did that, that undue influence come in the form of threats either to them or to their families? Um, you know, it, it, so was there vulnerability? Was there informed consent? Was there undue influence? And was there coercion? Those are some of the things that I'm looking mm. for. I think we're going to see Joseph used a mixture of sort of carrot and stick. He would particularly like he would offer the men rewards and then he would make threats to the women um, is generally what I think we're going to see a pattern of. Okay. Yeah. The men and parents maybe, mm -hmm. right? Yes. The men and parents. Okay. Okay, all right. So let's jump to the Nauvoo Expositor. Does someone want to give just the, the quick 30 second overview of what the Nauvoo Expositor was? I nominate Sam. Okay, Samantha. <laughs> Arguably the worst choice he made. So uh, as I understand it, it was written, was it William Law who yep. created? Yep, so guy who was uh, originally buddy buddy with Joseph Smith found out about Joseph's polygamy, was very disturbed by it, was seeing Joseph lie to the community and say, no, I'm, I don't have any extra wives, uh, that's slander. And then essentially published a newspaper detailing what Joseph was actually engaged in, which ultimately led to Joseph burning down a printing press, being put in prison and then eventually being killed. And the only thing I would add to that, Samantha, is that he wasn't just buddy buddies with Joseph Smith. He was in the first presidency of the Church mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ of Latter-day right. Saints. So it would be comparable to Dallin H. Oaks or uh, Henry Eyring today breaking from the first presidency and then telling the membership what Russell M. Nelson uh, as the prophet is doing secretly in a way that's deceptive and harmful. Not gonna lie, can I advocate for that? I, I think we need that to happen. Can I just to Don't the universe? They probably have watertight NDAs at this point, but they wouldn't have back then. Yeah, yeah. maybe. But I just think I think it's important to mention his status. It, it was way more than just buddy buddy. But I know yeah. you were. I, I was know scared you were just, to assert something incorrect. Yeah, no, that was good. Okay, Julia. So do you want to do you want to take us through how the Navu Expositor connects to all this? Yeah, so, so I'm using the Nauvoo Expositor as sort of a springboard to talk about this human trafficking. And these are just some quotes that I really liked that really kind of put a light or a spotlight on these things. So he says that the many items of doctrine are taught secretly and denied openly, which we know he was doing. William claimed that Joseph Smith would not make acknowledgments for these doctrines of like specifically plural marriage, but would rather be damned. Joseph Smith seemed to have thought that confessing would prove the overthrow of the church. And then he says, whoredoms and all manner of abominations are practiced under the cloak of religion. And then I just love this line. He says, lo, the wolf is in the fold. 
What do you love about that? I don't know. It's just a really great image of like, because it's because sheep are these really docile creatures, but then seeing this wolf in the fold, it's going to prove the overthrow of this church. I, I don't know. I just thought that was a really good image. <laughs> Really quickly, I want to I want to thank uh, Rebecca Raven for her super chat donation through YouTube. Thank you, Rebecca. She writes, I, I learned so much from these sessions. Thanks to everyone who's joining us on YouTube on the live stream, and we want to we want to welcome all all donations. And please subscribe to YouTube. Please follow us. That that helps with our growth and with the algorithms. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I'll also add that while we've talked about the Book of Mormon having in the doc, you know the Book of Mormon having a clause um, that, that that said basically the default is polygamy and concubines are bad, and then there's a clause in the Book of Mormon by 1844 that says if God's going to do it, He's going to do it, but otherwise it's bad. I think it's also worth noting that the Book of Commandments slash Doctrine and Covenants during the time of uh, Nauvoo uh, prohibited polygamy and denied that the saints were practicing polygamy. This DNC section 132 that we just mentioned didn't come until what, the 1870s? Is that right? Oh, well, it was written in 1842. Do you mean it was when it was published? It didn't, it didn't become part of the DNC that the right. members would reference. Mm -hmm. In other words, when William Law is decrying polygamy and saying that we have a wolf uh, in the fold, it's partly because Joseph Smith was not only publicly denying it, all the all the scripture, all the Mormon scripture that was existent in 1844 was also prohibiting polygamy and concubines. Am I wrong? No, you're correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah DNC 101 at the time in the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants specifically says marriage is between one man and one woman, and there's an entire revelation for that. So, yeah. It's so like, Joseph Smith was violating his own scripture is the point I'm making. Yes. It's like you know? with the current leaders of the church and the whole SEC debacle, right? They've lied. And, and everything I can find in Mormon scripture says that we should be honest and that we shouldn't lie to people. And everything in the teachings of the church says that, you know, to lie is to lead someone to believe something that isn't true. And all these sorts of definitions that all fit with all the dishonesty that's going on. It's like me doing what William Law is doing now, I'm telling people, I'm going, look, this is really bad. They're not living up to the standards of the church. And then maybe in 30 years time, there being a revelation that comes and goes, oh, by the way, if God says that you want to lie, then that's fine. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're another, living that. <laughs> another way to say that for me is if modern Mormon church leaders lie, it's hard not to imagine that they draw their influence from Joseph Smith's example. Is that fair? Uh, absolutely fair yeah. and also just a hallmark of high control groups that it's one rule for the members and another rule for the leaders so unconsciously they're just uh you know operating right out of the textbook for high control groups and cults yeah rules rules for thee but not for me is that is that the way the mm -hmm. way it's said samantha well said john all right so uh let's go more to more william law in the novel expositor julia Yes, I don't know if I want to read this whole thing, but it's really important as far as using this to show human trafficking. So I'll just I, you know, this is important to me. So I would like to read it if okay. you don't want to. Is that sure. is that okay? Yeah, if you want to, yeah, go ahead. I th this this is why I did the episode. This is not me trying to force fit sort of the the current Tim Ballard OUR narrative onto Joseph Smith. When I first discovered the Nauvoo Expositor probably 20 years ago and I read through this, I was deeply disturbed. Um, and it, it made sense, especially because my ancestors come to the United States from Great Britain. So I, I was particularly impacted by this. So is it okay if I read it? Yeah, go for it. Okay, this is this is William Law um, in the Nauvoo Expositor complaining about what's happening with women from Europe coming to America under the influence of Joseph Smith. He writes, um, it is a notorious fact that many females in foreign climes and in countries to us unknown, even in the most distant regions of the Eastern Hemisphere, have been induced by the sound of the gospel to forsake friends 
and I would say family and community, as Nemo pointed out, and embark upon a voyage across waters that lie stretched over the greater portion of the globe as they supposed to glorify God that they might thereby stand acquitted in the day of God Almighty but what is taught them on their arrival at this place? That's the informed consent part. They are visited by some of the strikers, for we know uh, know not what else to call them, and are requested to hold on and be faithful, for there are great blessings awaiting the righteous, and that God has great mysteries in store for those who love the Lord and cling to Brother Joseph. They are also notified that Brother Joseph will see them soon and reveal the mysteries of heaven to their full understanding, which seldom fails to inspire them with new confidence in the prophet, as well as a great anxiety to know what God has laid up in store for them in return for the great sacrifice of father and mother of gold and silver, which they gladly left far behind, that they might be gathered into the fold and numbered among the chosen of God. For me, this is the silver bullet slide. This talks about a lack of informed consent, about vulnerability, about coercion, about their sacrifices, and it impl it implicates Joseph Smith. And this was not written in, you know, 2023 or 1900 or even 1870. This was written by a first presidency member in 1844. Uh, Nemo is actually showing the Nauvoo Expositor there. Julia, you'll hold up the new book that you are um, that you are releasing for people who want to read it. And I just have a quick question: What do we make of the word "strikers"? I don't know what that word even means in this context. Can anyone enlighten me there? Might be a question for the chat, John. Yeah, can we flash back to the quote again, John? Yes, Samantha, go for it. Uh, where is the strikers piece? So there? they are visited by some of oh, the yeah. strikers, for we know not what else to call them and are requested to hold on. This sounds to me like people close to Joseph Smith who are in charge of receiving these immigrants. And when they're when the immigrants come to the, the vulnerable women, when they come to the United States and are unhappy, it seems like minions of Joseph Smith that sort of tell them, don't freak out, blessings await you, everything's gonna be okay, hold on, Joseph's gonna meet with you and make it all right. Mm. So Does anybody I, have a sense for what that word means? Go ahead, Samantha. Well, I read an, a contemporary news article of a journalist describing uh, what it looked like when the immigrants would arrive under Brigham. So this is under Brigham, but I imagine there will be some similarities. And basically, first of all, they were taken to the tithing house to, you know, give stuff to the church. And then they were taken to this area outside in the scene that was being described. And there were like militiamen holding guns standing around the perimeter. And they had to basically sleep on the hard ground overnight. And the, they, this journalist described how the sort of high up leaders of the church, maybe this is what uh, strikers could mean, but uh, bishops and things like that would would come in to this, uh, you know, parking lot style space of uh, of people, some of whom were like women who were sobbing because they just hadn't anticipated Utah having this kind of vibe with, you know, like the guns and it, and it all being so heavily regimented. But basically, as soon as they would arrive, like the the men at the top would come in and be scouring for like, who do I want to take as my wife? And Any a lot other... of the time it, it could be uh, people that maybe didn't necessarily speak much English and that, you know, they're just a meet, they don't, they don't have anything with them. They are now fully at the mercy of this system that again, they weren't anticipating to be like this. So when a bishop comes and is like taking them under their wing, they, they have no choice but to, to go with it. Any other any other theories on the word striker or anything else we want to say about about this slide? It just um, seems well, like they might be the men that come to your door and say, "Oh, it, it could be post the fact as well." Is what I'm thinking. It could be afterwards. Women that are maybe a bit worried about the situation they found themselves in. These are the men that are coming and saying, "No, no, no, keep on, hold the faith." 
Okay. Um, don't try and get out of this. Sorry, Julia. It's, it's interesting that in the text, they're saying we're having a hard time coming up with a word mm -hmm. to describe what, what these people are. Julia, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I know he's referring to missionaries who deliver these messages, and we'll talk about those in the slides. Um, one other definition, I think this is from the 1828 um, Webster's Dictionary, um, where it says that a, a striker is a blacksmith's helper who swings the sledgehammer. So like, you could just say, like, a helper of Joseph or, like, a... I don't know, like, um, but, but mostly he's referring to these missionaries. Kind of like a henchman or an assistant. Yeah, and, and the that, word that... minion is used in one of these sources, so I thought that was a good description, too. Okay. And weren't a lot of uh, men in Mormonism, early Mormonism, like, they were all armed, which was something that was surprising to me reading, again, these contemporary news sources, like how present uh, guns were in in the whole environment. I don't know if that maybe started with Brigham. Browning or... was a Browning was a Mormon, no? John Moses Browning was oh, a wow. was an early Mormon pioneer. Did not is know. Is he that. a is he a arms maker, Nemo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um yeah, a lot of American arms are made by Browning, so a lot of weapons in the first and second world war, like yeah. the Browning high power is quite a common pistol still used today. Um so yeah, th there was a there was a gunsmith on site at least one yeah. during these early days. So Julia, you you, you um, I, I went ahead and read the entire slide. Is there anything else you wanted to tease out of, of this quote uh, other than what I what we've discussed so far? No, I just like it. Like it pull, like I highlighted parts that to me pull out this these idea of victims where you're removing them at the great sacrifice of mother and father. You're removing them from financial security. They, you're removing them from their homes, females in foreign climes. Um, and you're offering great but they're offering great they are offered great blessings and they cling to Brother Joseph. So like this is just setting the stage really, really perfectly. Like you said, the silver bullet for this whole topic is this slide, like it's, or this Novo Expositor, right? And I don't know, just a very clear picture. So John, I had one more thought. Um, I remember I talked to Julia about it yesterday. Go ahead. Is that all right? Um, yeah. So the bit that stands out to me is where it says that they left gold and silver and they gladly left it, they gladly left their gold and silver part behind. And I was thinking, what is the first story in the Book of Mormon? It is a family leaving their gold and silver behind to go on a journey to follow a prophet to go across the sea. Yeah. And I hadn't thought about this before, but could that have been used by some missionaries to try and convince people that that's what they needed to do too, to leave their things far behind to go across the sea to follow God's Brilliant. call to America? That's just That came to me the other day when I was chatting to Julia about it, so I thought it's worth sharing. Brilliant. And the other, and the other thing that I think is going to escape a lot of people's processing is it's one thing to kidnap people and and chain them and force them into slavery which i'm sure happens it happened i'm sure it's, it still happens um to this day it obviously does but there's there's something called learned helplessness that marty seligman of uh, from from uh you know the psychology field helped helped us understand better uh, a a more powerful type of chains is is what some would refer to as learned helplessness. In other words, if you've got these poor, desperate women who are wondering about death, they're seeing death all around them, they're not able to feed themselves. If you promise them sort of a Zionic community, if you promise them a prophet of God who speaks with God and who can guarantee not only them, but their entire family salvation, that's an incredible amount of influence that lulls people through a carrot to give um, undying devotion. And in that sense, that promise, that undue influence of celestial access and power becomes uh, mental chains of their own making that don't require physical chains. And that's why I think that's so important. Samantha. Well, just and also, the, again, these the, a lot of these immigrants that were coming over not knowing what kind of system they were going to have to end up participating in, they don't they don't have a way to go back. Like it wasn't really a viable option for them to go back, even if they could mentally uh, free themselves from those chains. Like they are in a, a very theocratic community all of a sudden that does have militia men, and you know, leaving is just simply not an option. So right. it, it's kind of a mix of that emotional and physical, uh, you know, in theory, they could try and escape. But, it, but you know, for the average poor Swedish woman who has nothing to her name and has, you know, given what she does have to this community, 
Does it even he doesn't does even not. speak the language? I mean, we yeah, should probably like say that. Does doesn't not even speak have the, the ability to go back, even if she, you know, could mentally free herself. Like, so you you can see how you would, well, A, probably uh, be just too scared to even attempt to escape. Mm -hmm. And B, there's a, a, a massive uh, psychological incentive to just assimilate and to just trust these people. Because, you know, it's it's too horrifying to reckon with the fact that this is all... Mm -hmm. you know, what it truly was from my perspective. Uh, they were lucky to have survived getting there. You know, if you came across in one of the handcart companies, you saw people around you die on this thousand mile journey to get there. So you're hardly going to consider going back, mm. you, know, you know, because you wouldn't have the support of that large group. Um, you'd almost certainly die trying to make the journey back yourself. Certainly, If you the, could, if you could even beginning. afford it. Yeah. And, and weren't, weren't the naval journeys potentially as perilous as the, the pioneer treks? Or do you guys even know? I haven't like I'm that. sure, the, I'm sure those those journeys by sea weren't super fun, right? Yeah, mm. yeah, they were. They were slight. Well, you've got the journey across the Atlantic anyway, and then uh, a lot of people would come up the river. Certainly, when the the Saints were in Nauvoo, they'd come up the river on steamers um, to get there. But then, obviously, afterwards, there's not the infrastructure to get across the plains for a long time. So, uh, did some people come round onto the uh, other coast, onto the Pacific coast? Was that a journey people made up oh, through California? Oh, no, no, I'm sure it was Atlantic. No, mm -hmm. I, I didn't mean to imply Pacific. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, um, Maven's moderating the comments for us. Thanks, Maven. She highlighted a comment from Trev Anon. The reluctant polygamist gives me the term striker to describe the seducers who were telling women it was acceptable to participate in illicit intercourse. Trev Anon is living in Europe. He played an important role in helping us archive and and uh, create time codes and show notes for past episodes. So shout out to our European listener, Trevenon, who I think has never been Mormon, but he comes through with a definition of the term striker. Anyone on the panel want to react to that 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 definition? I that trust Trev. Sounds yeah. about right. All right. I'll read that again. It is the seducers who were telling women it was acceptable to participate in illicit intercourse. All right. Thanks, Trevenon. Okay. Yeah. So, so again, back to your point, Julia, th this excerpt from the Nauvoo Expositor to me shows that William Law was as concerned about trafficking as we all are trying to be in this episode. It just shows that his mind was on trafficking. Is that fair to say, Julia? Yes, and we'll see later with these other newspaper articles that he wasn't the only one. There were people in Great Britain and elsewhere that were also concerned. Yeah. Now, this next slide is really, really crucial. It's something that even in 2023, with me 20 plus years into all this, I hadn't thought about. You don't hear a lot of concern about male trafficking. Can you talk to us about that, Julia? <laughs> Okay, so this is something I was reading um, in Sacred Loneliness, and he points out something really interesting. He says... Todd Compton, right? Yes, sorry, Todd Compton. So in talking about Orson Pratt and Samuel Smith's mission to Boston, in which he gets one of Joseph Smith's polygamous wives, he says, if there were male converts in Boston, they are not mentioned. And I think that's super interesting. And so I also wrote, throughout church history, women were converted to the church, not taught anything about polygamy, traveled across the country or sometimes as far away as Europe or even Boston. Having, uh, having given up their homes, riches, and family members, and then were given to be to married men as their polygamous wives. So, yeah, this these missionaries are going out to find polygamous wives. So, yeah, the, you, you, uh, there just aren't a lot of male converts, young, young male converts coming over, and that fits with what we know about the lost boys in the FLDS communities. When when, when there's a competition for young women young men aren't aren't desired is that fair to mm. say <laughs> there were also uh, news articles written at the time about how uh there would be a lot of instances where for example a wife and daughter would travel to utah first and then when the husband would arrive a few months later uh again not knowing that he was going into a polygamous system this is also still under brigham sorry i keep talking about brigham when we're talking about joseph smith but he would find upon getting to Utah that both his wife and daughter had become, you know, second, third polygamous wives to men in leadership positions. And his only option was basically like take up arms for us, you know, become part of our militia and just deal with it. Yeah, very good. And uh, Thomas Moore points out in the chat, this gave us Sherlock Holmes, right? Arthur Conan Doyle did in a study in Scarlet talk about 
it is essentially this, in part the story of a young woman who's trafficked to Utah to become a polygamous woman and then tries to escape, but ultimately she kills herself because that's kind of all she sees is the way out. Spoiler alert if you haven't read Study in Scarlet by Arthur Conan Doyle, but that's the first Sherlock Holmes book. Yeah, I mean, authors are going to choose carefully the topics that they choose and they're not going to mm -hmm. just pick random things that really don't have any relevance to real life oftentimes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was definitely very much in the zeitgeist as we're going to see over the next few slides. Yeah. All right. So let's go to the next slide, which is missionaries converting wives. Yeah. So this is this is a guy. Um, it's a letter to an apostate Mormon to his son. And this was written, in, published in 1908. So this is during Brigham Young's time. But he's referring to an older woman who could very well have been not in Utah before the before the trek over there. But he says in talking about this woman, he says she then told me that her husband had been to England as a missionary and had brought back a young woman with whom he had become whom with whom he had become his second wife. She said, oh, no, this is her experience with that. No woman can ever know what I have suffered since. Night after night, I have lain on my lonely bed, alone and comfortless. I have walked the floor for hours and have talked, walked to and fro through the night between the cabin and the cabin where he, where he stays with his other wife. Years after, she said to me, thank God, I am all over it now. I do not care for anything now. I am not a woman, only a stone. She broke down and cried, and I left the house with doubts as to the hardness of such a life because I had not yet been tried by the curse of polygamy. And I just thought this was a really, like, first of all, the story is really heartbreaking, but then him going to England to find a polygamous wife is also, that's that's part of this trafficking that we're talking about. It's also, Any other, uh, Samantha? Yeah, well, I think it's interesting because, you know, earlier you were talking about how a lot of uh, women polygamous wives did not see themselves as victims, but we also do have so many accounts of women who, who cl clearly did feel victimized by this system, but it's just, uh, you know, complaining wasn't allowed. We have uh, talks from Brigham Young where he's scolding the women for complaining and basically saying they'll get kicked out of the community if they keep complaining. So it's not like they had much of a voice, but we, we do seem to have a number of records of uh, women and girls absolutely feeling like victims. That, that, that quote, I am not a woman, only a stone to me, that just speaks to the objectification of polygamy. It's it. I heard someone once say five cents to a dollar, a woman's worth is a fraction of a man's because it's, it's a numerical, it's a numerical proposition where women can only be, cannot be anything else but devalued. Something I found as a theme in all the contemporary news articles I was reading in recent weeks is all these journalists describe Mormon women as never smiling, always looking so gloomy and unhappy. There was even one article describing uh, what immigrants looked like on the boat and how they just completely kept to themselves, barely ate. Like there, there seemed to have been uh, I don't know. I sort of originally imagined that these these converts a lot of the time would be full of life and and so zesty, but um, apparently it was just kind of uh, widely known that Mormon women were treated poorly and also that they seemed deeply unhappy. Yeah, I, I want to add to that. Oh, go ahead, Julia. I just want to add. So, in the book Wife Number Nineteen by Annaliza Webb Young is she's one of Joseph Smith's or excuse me, one of Brigham Young's wives. And she talks about that as well. And we have, I put a slide in there talking about the condition of, of these plural wives and how they just is sort of, they sort of became the stereotype of, of these ugly haggard women. And like you were saying, these, they're, this isn't the life of what one would think that this is the true gospel or that this is like the, people talk about the countenance of the Mormons being so bright, but like, that's not, that was not what was the case during these years of polygamy. Yeah. Well, let's go to this next slide about missionaries picking out convert wives, Julia. Yeah, so this one is, this one's post Joseph Smith. This was from 1860, but this is Heber C. Kimball, and this was published in the New York Times. I don't have this article, so this is behind a paywall, but if anyone wanted to share with me, I would not say no. But he says, brethren, I want you to understand that it is not to, that it is not to be as it has been there here, excuse me, heretofore. The brother missionaries have been in the habit of picking out the prettiest women for themselves before they get here and bringing on the ugly ones for us. Hereafter, you have to bring them all here before taking any of them and let us have a fair shake. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that quote, Julia? <laughs> so, <laughs> there are so many things wrong with this. These are missionaries converting people to the true gospel. They should not be picking out wives anyway. 
but also how this just really gross and degrading to to call women ugly first of all and to say that these men are picking out the pretty ones and leaving the ugly ones so don't pick out any of them wait till they all get here it's just all of that's gross this I, coming I, from yeah go the ahead, same Samantha. man who said that he thinks as much of taking a wife as he does buying a cow Mm -hmm. uh, maybe yes, we blend. found the original Johnny Lingo inspiration. I think <laughs> is uh, this guy. Yeah, I wanna I wanna just go ahead and share um, just uh, just one little um, definition. I as I was studying feminism more, I came upon the word chattel, and I was always like, do they mean to say cattle? Is that just like a British pronun pronunciation <laughs> of the word cattle? <laughs> Chattel is a catch-all category of property associated with movable goods. At common law, chattel included all property other than real property. Examples include leases, animals, and money. In modern usage, chattel usually only refers to tangible, movable, personal property. And Indeed. I remember in the suffrage movement, there being women basically saying, if you don't want us to vote, you're basically treating us as chattel subhuman. And you kind of just you get that vibe when when you read this quote from from Heber C. Kimball that women Mormon women Mormon polygamous women are more chattel than humans. Is that fair? Oh yeah, and I, he says a lot of those things like comparing them to cows and things like that. Those are yeah. This isn't even the worst quote I think, but yes, for sure. Yeah, this is is a very good example of the objectification of women. Yes. They're being treated. They're being treated as objects to be divvied out between men in the worst way samantha in the worst way well i'm i'm not saying i agree with this characterization but there were writers at the time who again witnessed like immigrants arriving and witnessed the polygamous system in utah and compared uh, one writer compared the new influx of immigrants to being akin to an african slave mart so people were seeing uh, what was going on and, and comparing it to slavery and to meat markets. And like, that was very much the vibe of how people wrote about it outside the church. Yeah. And, and don't just take our word for it. Let's go to contemporary newspapers in, in, you know, Europe expressing concern. Do you want to read this to us, Julia, and tell us what this is? Yeah. So this is a newspaper um, published in Great Britain. This is the Chambers Edinburgh Journal. And let me, uh, make my screen. So is this out of Scotland, Nemo? Uh, yes, that would come out of Scotland. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it might be deemed superfluous to say so much on the subject were it not that the Mormon delusion has spread widely in North America and even in Great Britain. Joseph Smith and his colleagues settled in 1831 in Missouri. Um, once they were soon afterwards expelled on account of their lawless conduct. And I highlighted that just because polygamy is very lawless and they were doing a lot of other things. And then they went to Illinois and founded a town or city called Nauvoo near the Mississippi, and now it contains 1,700 abled bodies, men, exclusive of women and children. To this, to this place, too many immigrants are directing their course, even from Great Britain. But such blasphemous and deceitful stuff as this, the poor cotton spinner, like too many others, was induced to go to Nauvoo, where, like other victims of delusion, he was wretchedly used. The Mormon preachers in England had described Nauvoo as a land of over overflowing with milk and honey. It is needless to carry our to carry our notice of this matter further. Every shadow of evidence yet obtained tends to prove Mormonism to be a gross imposter and one unworthy of notice, save on account of the dangers which were which have here been described and exposed. I apologize wow. for my countrymen and their difficult way of writing. <laughs> Nemo, why don't you why don't you translate, we'll translate what, what she just read into <laughs> yeah, throw that English, back up on screen. American English? <laughs> oh, ooh, hell I'm on. kidding. Steady on, Sam, back me up. Uh, Steady on. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, throw that back up on screen for me, John. Yeah, I'll run through it. Okay. Yeah, Nemo, we need a translation mm -hmm. here. Yeah, that's fine. So basically, saying we wouldn't we wouldn't bother talking about it were it not that it had become so uh, popular and it's actually spread to our country. So maybe we do need to take a look. Uh, he outlines the lawlessness of what's going on and says that they're being moved from place to place, talks about how they've settled in Nauvoo, and it's a place that far too many people are going to, including people from Great Britain. Um, and then he talks about, this is, it comes in partly through a story about a cotton spinner, which again, I was talking about the industrialization of the UK, people working in cotton mills, people of a sort of lower class, not getting much chance for education. Um, he talks about those people are being victimized and uh, are being induced, induced is a good word, to go to Nauvoo. Um, and they are the victims of a delusion because they're talking about it as a land overflowing with milk and honey. Um, 
and he's saying we basically don't need to say anymore because everything we've looked at says that it isn't that and um and it's not really that important or significant apart from the fact that it's causing danger to our people because they're going there because what Nervu really was was a swamp full of mosquitoes rather than a land a land of uh, milk and honey and sexually desirous men looking for young mm -hmm. wives right yeah and and i just want to call everyone's attention to the year again on this newspaper article this is in 1860 this is in 1880 julia what's the year on this article 1842 which is two years before the novel expositor was published two years before joseph smith you know died you know okay, scandal, right we saw right through him <laughs> So many yeah. British newspapers saw right through Joseph Smith and the whole movement. But it was these people in more difficult circumstances, the sort of people that, regardless of the Mormon angle, would go, you know what, a life in America sounds better. If it's a land of opportunity where I can try and make better of my situation, and there's this organization that can organize me getting there, I'll go. And is that not classic human trafficking? You know, uh, yeah. someone telling you there are all these opportunities there, you're going to have such an abundant life, and then by the time you get there and have no way to get back from there... You find out it's not that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Uh, well, that that is, again, that's the second silver bullet of this episode, as far as I'm concerned. Why don't we go to the next slide, Julia? Um, so this one is, Nemo, did you put this one up? <coughs> mm -hmm. Do you want to, you want do you want to read it, Nemo? Yeah, yeah, can do. Yeah, I was just looking at it on my other screen. Okay, so it happens some... This is 1861, so this is a slightly later one um, because you, polygamy is starting to come out now. Go on. Okay, uh, go ahead. Okay, sure. Uh, it happens sometimes that women, after having drunk the cup of polygamy, become sensible of its deadly effects and end by opening their eyes to the pitfall into which a blind confidence in their missionaries has lured them. They weep bitterly and would fain fly, but they are mothers and how can they abandon their children? Maternal love rises up stronger than the shame which overwhelms them. Moreover, they feel themselves dishonoured and betrayed, and innocent as they feel themselves to be by the verdict of their own conscience, yet in spite of this, they think not themselves the less degraded. The marriages they have contracted are purely religious. No civil authority has ratified them. Everywhere else they would be considered concubinage. Which I think raises a really good point that exists in polygamous communities today. The idea that these marriages that they're entering into aren't legally ratified. So these women have no rights. They have no recourse if the husband just decides to kick them out. They have no access to their children. They have no right to money from him. It's, it's a really horrible situation for polygamous women to be in. And it's still going on now. Also, other... other the, yeah. I was just going to say, the, word concu the, the use of the word concubine, and specifically in the Book of Mormon, condemns concubines i just thought that was a really interesting mm -hmm. thing that in this newspaper in the 1860s was saying the church is going against their own doctrine in a way yeah absolutely okay and again that's 1861 mm -hmm. but um i think it's still relevant to what was going on mm -hmm. uh we've got another one from 1843 which again is a year before the nauvoo expositor while joseph smith's still alive samantha do you want to read this one yeah so it says we have often deplored the existence of such a system of delusion as that concocted and practiced by the notorious Joe Smith and his fellows, and have repeatedly warned the honest and industrious working class of this country against being made the dupes of those designing fellows. The said Nauvoo being represented as a very terrestrial paradise, where want, care, toil, and the thousand annoyances to which society is subject here are kept at an unapproachable distance and where their opposites are in luxuriant abundance. They want either young women that they may ruin them or young men to be their slaves. The males from 18 to 45 years of age are all required to bear arms. The writer describes this place as miserable, the condition of the settlers are wretched and the conduct of the prophet and his minions as abominable and blasphemous in the extreme. Again, we say, be not duped by these imposters. So this sounds like Go what was going journal. on. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> sounds like what was going on was like, we're getting all these reports of this place called Nauvoo and so many people are going over there. Um, so they've almost sent a reporter or spoken to a reporter who's been there to see what is actually going on there. What is the truth of this place that these missionaries are inviting people to? Um, and that was their report. I, would almost other... call that, I was going to say, I would almost call that another silver bullet to me. Like, is this, they're just blatantly, they're just saying it. They're saying... Women are being 
taken and men are being taken for their labor. I don't know how they could be more clear. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful. All right. Um, and again, that's from Ireland. Let's go ahead and talk now about German mm -hmm. attitudes. We've talked about Scotland and Ireland. What's yeah. going on in Germany? So I, I pulled this one forward from a book that I was reading. Um, so I was, because I, 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 I said to Judah, I'm pretty sure there's something, there's something. And sure enough, uh, Mormons were all but effectively banned um, by the German government um because of reports of polygamy so in 1853 the prussian interior ministry issued a runda a runderlass which is a circular stating official government policy that denied the mormons legal status in prussia and that in effect became a standing expulsion order that authorities used to harass detain and deport the church's missionaries throughout the 19th century mormons clashed with the german authorities over emigration not only because of the emotional issue of german women becoming polygamous concubines but also because of mormon immigration's effect on draft eligible men wow so that's that's not hitler germany that's no, that's, that's weimar republic mid 19th century yeah. germany identifying this polygamy trafficking for what it mm -hmm. was and prohibiting mormons from from being a part of a um, an integrated part of their society. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So missionaries were constantly getting kicked out and they were trying to remove missionaries. And uh, the problem was that the Americans were sending a lot of German converts back as missionaries and then they would come back and these young men would be detained because they'd be accused of not having fulfilled their military service requirements or whatever. Uh, it was just all, it was all a big mess. And it's the reason that the headquarters for the church were in Switzerland. Um, the headquarters for the church in Europe were in Switzerland, not in Germany. They couldn't have them in Germany because the church faced so much uh opposition at the time as i'm channeling the mormon the orthodox believing mormon mindset we've been conditioned to encode any adversity as anti-mormonism as satan's influence as sort of like satan working with evil people to thwart the purposes of god so when like scotland and england and germany and other countries are saying things like hey this trafficking is bad this polygamous trafficking of our women is bad i just know that in my orthodox mormon mindset i'm not paying attention to that as like wow they were calling it correctly at the time it was happening instead my mind just immediately dismisses it as anti-mormon satan you know inspired opposition can you guys r relate to that yeah but it's yeah. worth noting that the people within Mormonism were uh, corroborating the types of things that were being written. I mean, Brigham Young and John Taylor both had daughters who tried to escape Utah because they hated living under the brutal polygamous system, but they were both captured by the church's guards and brought back and weren't allowed to escape like that. And they, at least one of uh, those daughters was 22. So, I mean, that just objectively is trafficking you know like forcing someone to st to you know remain in a place where they're or you know bringing them back against their will yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think i think it's very easy for us to fall into the trap as believing mormons to say oh well these people had a, an angle against mormons they didn't you read in that first one actually it's not worth us talking about the mormons other than they're a bit of a danger to our people the brits are literally saying they're they're insignificant they're unimportant to our daily life we don't really care that much about them but we're bringing it up because loads of people are getting duped and we need it to stop it's the only reason it was getting written about so this isn't some like conspiracy against mormonism the britons to use a colloquial phrase couldn't give a toss for the most part <laughs> Which I think me and Nemo can confirm. They really yes. don't give a shit about Mormonism. They don't care. It's not on their radar. No, not to, even today, it's not. Even other today. than there's these towns where they're annoyed at the Mormons because they stole away all their working age people. You know, they stole away all their farmhands and, and they all went off to America. That's what that's what got the Brits annoyed, if anything. Yeah. yeah. But it's also trafficking vulnerable women and putting them into abusive sexual um circumstances right there was probably concern about that i think that was a genuine concern yeah that's 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 the point i'm ma we're, we're making is the only reason they brought it up is because they had genuine concerns about what was going on yeah not because right. they hated their religion because like i said they didn't think it was particularly significant yeah yeah and this next slide speaks to the issue of informed consent and deception which for me is particularly important um, in all this julia yeah, so this is from the same book, Letters of an Apostate Mormon to His Son. 
And again, it's published in 1908, but it's still applicable. He says, in speaking of a convert named Jorgen, I think is how you pronounce it. They told him that the only possible, these are the missionaries. The missionaries told him that the only possible escape from his sin was to join the Mormon church. But, said Jorgen, people say that Brigham Young is a polygamist. How do I know that Joseph Smith is, is not the one of one of the false prophets of which the Bible speaks? But the elder said that Brigham Young was not a polygamist, that polygamy was not a part of the Mormon system, and that the Book of Mormon opposed polygamy. Yikes. Yeah. Why Why yikes, Nemo? It's just patently untrue. <laughs> it's, it's a bold-faced lie. Mm. It doesn't get much more brazen than that in terms of lies that that members of the church will tell to try and convince people. And yeah. it's also telling because uh, were that person to immigrate, they would obviously discover that that wasn't true, but presumably they had enough confidence in the the power of the system once immigrants arrived that like, despite the fact that they were learning that those kinds of things were lies, they'd still be able to keep them. Well, I guess it's that sunk cost fallacy that they're relying on, isn't it? They've made that big journey, they've got there, they know it'd be terribly difficult, if not impossible to leave. So they're like, well, I guess I better get on with it. And also this idea, An this Jürgen. Violence, pardon? I think. Like actually yeah, yeah, physical yeah. restraint. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Jürgen as well, clearly a male. So actually he may have discovered that once he got involved in the system, he quite liked the, the newfound power it gave him. You know, it, it's very possible because he would have been yeah. one of the benefactors of that system if he was into that kind of thing. And I hope I'm not um, stealing the thunder of, a, of an upcoming slide, but when I discovered that, you know, Mormon missionaries were going to Europe and literally administering flyers that denied that Mormons were practicing polygamy back in the United States and that polygamists themselves, Mormon polygamist missionaries were administering pamphlets that were claiming that polygamy wasn't happening. That was one of the most disturbing things I've ever read uh, related to this topic. Is that is that is there a slide on that, or or can any of you guys confirm that that happened? That that polygamist missionaries were handing out pamphlets denying that polygamy was being practiced. I don't have a slide on that. I would love to see that source, and I would love to know what yeah. year those what year that happened. Yeah. Me too. I don't I don't have, know anything for certain. I think yeah. there's even an account or several accounts of John Taylor in Europe denying that they were practicing polygamy while exactly. he was over there. Wow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll have to pull up that. Maybe maybe one of our viewers or listeners can can pull up that resource as we continue this presentation. Because I, I'm pretty sure that's factual. But just to make the point, these women were being deceived. It wasn't it wasn't informed consent where it's like, hey, polygamy's awesome. We're practicing it back in the United States, and you too can be a polygamous wife of Joseph Smith or of one of his best friends. That was not how these women were being uh, sold a, a trip to the United States. Fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, and uh, I don't know, do we want Nemo to, to read this one, Julia? Uh, sure, yeah. Sure. Can do, right. All right, who, yeah. who is this? Is this a quote from the Nauvoo Expositor, Julia? Yeah, it's from, the, it's from the preamble, I believe. It just, yeah, from the Nauvoo Expositor. Okay, so this is William Law and whoever helped him write it in the voice okay. of Nemo. <clears throat> they are visited again. And what is the result? They are requested to meet Brother Joseph or some of the Twelve at some insulated point or at some particularly described place on the bank of the Mississippi or at some room which wears upon its front positively no admittance. The harmless, inoffensive and unsuspected creatures are so devoted to the Prophet and the cause of Jesus Christ that they do not dream of the deep laid and fatal scheme which prostrates happiness and renders death itself desirable. But they meet him, expecting to receive through him a blessing and learn the will of the Lord concerning them. And what awaits the faithful follower of Joseph, the apostle and prophet of God, when in the stead thereof? They are told, after having been sworn in one of the most solemn manners to never divulge what is revealed to them, with a penalty of death attached, that God Almighty has revealed it to him, that she should be his, Joseph's, spiritual wife. For it was right anciently, and God will tolerate it again. But we must keep those pleasures and blessings from the world, for until there is a change in the government, we will endanger ourselves by practicing it. But we can enjoy the blessings of Jacob, David, and others, as well as to be deprived of them, if we do not expose ourselves to the law of the land. She is thunderstruck, faints, recovers, and refuses. 
The prophet damns her if she rejects. She thinks of the great sacrifice and of the many thousand miles she has travelled over sea and land that she might save her soul from pending ruin and replies, God's will be done and not mine. The prophet and his devotees in this way are gratified. All right. Who wants That's... to translate what, what you just read, Nemo? <sighs> Sam. Oh, God. <laughs> Get back to it. <laughs> um, if not, okay. I can jump in. Uh all right, Sam. Uh, and, and Sam, it, it's okay. Nemo, why don't you summarize yeah, what, what, what you it. just yeah, read? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I dropped Sam in at there. Okay, so um, he's talking about young women that are taken to uh, a secluded place, either on the bank of the river or into a room where they put a sign up that says positively no admittance. So they make this room uh, secret and pull it to one side. Um, and then they think they're there to get a blessing from Joseph Smith or they're there to hear something about what God has in store for them. Um and what happens is Joseph proffers them spiritual marriage. He proffers them polygamy. Uh, and they kind of understand what it means. Uh, he tries to justify it with biblical passages and they, they faint, say no. Then he threatens them and says, well, actually, no, this is, this is not going to be spiritually good for you if you don't. And then they think about, as we talked about, they have this sunk fa cost fallacy moment where they think, you know, and I wouldn't even call it a fallacy at this point because it is just a, a recognized sunk cost of theirs that they've traveled thousands of miles. They've come all this way seeking spiritual deliverance. And the man who promised it to them is now saying, well, this is how you get it. And they say, well, then not my will, but God's be done. And um, I have to say all of this is done under the threat of a death penalty to uh, to if you reveal it, because they're told that the government will ruin the whole uh, enterprise if they find out. Is yeah, that about right? It does feel like even sunk cost fallacy is like not a, a strong enough way to describe it because they're feeling mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm I'm in a dangerous situation here. Like I'm mm -hmm. essentially being threatened. I imagine the whole vibe was extremely threatening. Yeah. Love it. Really quickly, just as a matter of uh, kind of business, huge thanks to Brian Pratt for his Super Chat donation. These donations help us pay for these guests and for all the production behind the scenes. Brian Pratt writes, extremely important episode. Mormon Stories has helped me so much in my deconstruction process. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian Pratt, for the super chat. Everyone who's listening and viewing now, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or Facebook. Please share this episode wherever you can. That will help. And we always appreciate the donations. I'm also just going to quickly say that um, one of our viewers or listeners was able to find the reference that I uh, made, or at least one reference to it. It's called Three Nights Public Discussion, John Taylor. And I believe it's in uh, it's in this source that people can find, I guess maybe John Taylor's denial um, that, that polygamy was being practiced as a practicing polygamist. Um, and if anyone wants to correct me on that, they can. But please, Maven, we'll make sure Maven includes that in the show notes. Any any other comments before we go to the next slide? Other than you just beat me to it because I just pulled up that same thing from John Taylor. <laughs> okay. So. Well, we've got the reference so that people got can't it. claim us of maligning John nope. Taylor. Future prophet Mormon John Taylor apparently, as a polygamist, lied as a missionary in Europe claiming that polygamy wasn't happening. Um, mm -hmm. All right, let's go to the next slide, which is what did William Law mean? Go ahead, Julia. Yeah, so the oh. so I was told that the Nova Expositor was just a bunch of lies and ex, like just, just anti-Mormon literature. But these stories, so with the slide, what does William Law mean? Um, he's referencing two stories that actually did happen in church history. So with the story of positively no admittance, he's talking about a specific wife. And then, and then the one where he references on the banks of the Mississippi River, he's also talking about another specific wife, which we'll go through these wives later. But like I was just told that these were all lies, but everything he says in the novel expositor is just spot on. And he like we're finding references to everything that he's saying. So I'm just like, I mean, I guess I sort of feel in shock sometimes where I'm like, I believe these were lies. And then I'm finding out that the church is the one who was not being honest. And that this anti-Mormon literature is just now what Mormon historians confirm to be the truth. Yeah, like William Law is demonized as an apostate. He's demonized and dismissed and forgotten as an apostate. Yet he probably wrote word for word the most accurate depiction of Mormon history in the history in, in, in the entire 19th century. 
you could argue that William Law wrote the most important, most accurate piece of Mormon history, and he's forgotten and demonized, right? Yeah, and I'm and I feel sad that like me as a member for thirty plus years, I've never read this. This is the this is the paper that potentially got Joseph killed. Like um, there are so many members that I think don't have never read this, and they should give it a second look for sure. Yeah, it, it should be look. required reading, more yes. Mormon reading of all Mormons. Should, should definitely be a seminary lesson on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. when you're yeah. doing DNC. Yeah. All right. So did we did we clear this slide, Julia? Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to mention how accurate he is in these. The, he's just alluding to very specific stories, and I just wanted to point out, yeah, just that. Yeah. All right, Samantha, would you mind reading this next excerpt from the Nauvoo Expositor, and then Julia, you can interpret. Sure. Our hearts have mourned and bled at the wretched and miserable condition of females in this place. Many orphans have been the victims of misery and wretchedness through the influence that has been exerted over them under the cloak of religion and afterwards in consequence of that jealous disposition which predominates over the minds of some have been turned upon a wide world, fatherless and motherless, destitute of friends and fortune and robbed of that which nothing but death can restore. Ooh, Samantha, what's it, what's it saying there, Samantha? Hell of a line. It's talking about orphans. Uh, do they just mean... Uh, I'm assuming, well, it seems like Joseph would take in orphans, right? And, uh, or if someone had like a, a dead mother, he might send their father on a mission. And then, so they are motherless and fatherless. Is that the kind of people it's referring to? Absolutely. Joseph had orphans as polygamous wives yeah. um, and young girls. Which is very and, convenient and it, because even Tim Ballard says that separating kids from their parents is a pathway to being able to exploit them. Yeah. Now, in some cases, I think the parents had died, so it wasn't necessarily mm. Joseph creating the orphans, but certainly bringing in orphans as domestic help and then propositioning them as wives. And we've oh, covered yeah. that in the LDS discussions episodes on polygamy quite uh, extensively. Go ahead, Samantha. Well, I also think it's interesting because it mentioned, um, you can flash back to the quote if you want, but uh, it mentioned like the, the jealous disposition, which predominates over the minds of some is that talking about am i uh, taking a leap here is that talking about how the whole uh, if you have more priesthood keys than another man you can take their wife or what's that all about the jealousy thing anyone want to uh, well, anyone I on think, the panel julia i i, I kind of want to say that the priesthood keys might have happened under brigham because i know like right, analyze yeah. young talks about that a lot but the jealous disposition. So Emma was really struggling with all this, and there's a lot of stories of other Whoa. wives who are jealous. So I'm I'm wondering he's if this is just a general understanding of of the world that these women live in with yeah. polygamy. So that's what yeah. I was thinking. And I imagine like a lot of the 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 new wives, like it's not like they would have the support of Emma or you know, so and and again, they are essentially concubines, so they have no just no protection at all, even from the other women in this system. Yeah. I also wanted to point something else out that Please. so they talk about they talk about orphans and so I know I think there were actual orphans going that were there, um, but I wanted to point out Analyza Young and Wife Number Nineteen also points out that that they often use the word widows to describe a woman who is just separated from her husband like he's just not with her or he's in a, a different area and so they would call her a widow and so I just wonder if in the cases of orphans if these dads who are fathers who are sent on missions or mothers who are elsewhere. Um, if these women could classify as orphans, although I don't know if William Law would use that word. Um, so that's, just, so, but I just wanted to point out that where the widows are sometimes women who, whose husbands are just not with them, but they're still alive. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, let's go. Um, Nemo, were you going to say something? I just said, excellent. I was just yeah. applauding. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide about condition of polygamous wives. Nemo, you want to take a read? Absolutely. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know why I do that. It makes you sound very makes you sound very pretentious. Nemo uh, can read and Samantha can interpret the the reading. Yes. Perfect. Right. Okay. Gonna need that on screen. Thank you. <laughs> when flippant newspaper correspondents, after a visit to the Valley of the Saints, go away and write in terms of ridicule of the Mormon women, calling them fearfully ugly in looks, they little know the bitter, hard, cruel experiences have carved the deep lines around the eyes and mouths and made the faces grow repulsive and grim, and taken from them all the softness and tenderness and grace which glorify a happy woman's face, even if she be ever so plain of feature. 
If these men, who write so carelessly, could only see the interior of the lives that they are touching with it, such a rough, rude hand, they might be perhaps a little more sympathetic in tone. It is no wonder that the women of Utah are not beautiful. There is nothing in all their lives to glorify or beautify their faces, to add at all to their mental or physical charm or grace. They are pretty enough as children. As young girls, they can compare favorably with any girls I have seen in the East. But just as soon as they reach womanhood, the curse of polygamy is forced upon them, and from that moment their lives are changed, and they grow hard or die. One of the two. In their struggles to become inured to this unnatural life. I mean, on the one hand, I'm just repulsed that anyone would feel comfortable characterizing an entire gender within a state as being ugly. <clears throat> like in 21st century sensibilities that's deeply offensive and in here it's a woman doing it um but regardless of that samantha what, what what's your reaction to that quote yeah it's interesting because obviously i imagine most journalists at that time would be men um and i guess analyzer young is expressing her frustration that they will so flippantly cast these women or talk about how they're ugly which i assume because i've i've read a lot of those articles and, and i feel like it is coming from a place of wanting to portray the reality of life in Utah and, and the, you know, the fact that these women are not doing well and they're not like these shiny, happy things like they're sort of portrayed to be. Um, but yeah, I, I like that Anne Eliza Young is like, is highlighting that, that these women are being robbed. So like as soon as they reach adolescence, I mean, because it is true that sort of your inner world determines your external presentation in certain ways. You know, if you're, she talks about like the deep lines of grief being carved into their faces. And yeah, I suppose it's just, it's nice to hear a more uh, compassionate insider take of, of why the women presented that way. Though I did also read a lot of uh, contemporary news articles that were, you know, like talking about how wrong it was that Mormon mormonism treated women so poorly but yeah i'll just say from my perspective i did a deep dive about a year or two ago on my polygamous ancestors my grandmother karma parkinson benson was the daughter of a third wife so my great grandparents were polygamous in you know franklin preston logan Logan, Idaho and Franklin Preston, sorry, Logan, Utah and Franklin and Preston, Idaho. And when I read about my own great grandparents, I think William Brigham Parkinson was my, my, uh, the, the father of my maternal grandmother. And it just, it, the story that I saw was that he would get excited about his early wives, but then after a while he would get interested in subsequent wives and, and almost neglect the previous wives, and in some cases, completely abandoned them. And this is, again, my own great grandfather. I'm not talking about other, other people's uh, families. And one of the wives, the third wife, as I recall, ended up um, in addiction where she got addicted to opiates and uh, was completely abandoned. S you know, several of these kids died while he was serving a mission. Like it wasn't enough that this man had four wives, but then he was being called to serve as a missionary anyway. And so he's like almost abandoning these wives um, with multiple children, probably not financially supporting them. So frontier America, you know, in the, in the nine, you know, 19th or early 20th century was hard enough, but then to be in effect abandoned by your husband left to, to financially and in otherwise support your children, that's going to be really hard on any human. Mm -hmm. And, and so if there are uh, criticisms or, or characterizations of, of the appearance of Mormon pioneer, uh, or polygamous women, I can understand why that life was brutal and why it would lead to, um, you know, unhealthy circumstances that would be reflected in their appearance. It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, I feel like Anne Young is saying the body keeps the score and you yeah. can see it. And yeah, I don't know that uh, it's very possible to sort of like glow with beauty. I mean, she even says in that thing, like she's not necessarily talking about exceptional beauty, but just kind of the a, a general sense of well-being and radiance that can happen even with plain looking women when, you know, they're not grieving and, and they have their needs met and things. Yeah, really quickly, I just want to thank Robin 
Um, Nomae, I don't know how to pronounce that for her super chat donation. Also, Daddy Todd says, great episode. Thanks. And Christina Flores writes, thank you for doing all you do. We're glad that this episode is resonating with people and we're super grateful for those who are uh, donating uh, to help make this episode possible. Julia or Nemo, anything else you wanna say about the ugliness of Utah women? I say that um, sarcastically and embarrassed, you know, in an embarrassing way. So I think it was that Annalise Young in that same book where she describes sort of the opposite image of these men who were taking on polygamous wives. She describes them as being like, like jovial and young looking. And, and the more they take on younger wives, these older men, the older they get, the younger wives they take, the younger they seem to look. And I just thought that was a really interesting perspective from her who is a polygamous wife. So like stealing yeah. the youthfulness of these women, yeah. robbing them of that. Yeah. Mm. That's so sad. And, and, and remind me, this isn't just any polygam ex polygamous woman. This is a former wife of Brigham Young who lived polygamy uh, under the second Mormon prophet. Is that right, Julia? Yes. I don't think she was the, actually the wife number 19. I think she was further down the line, but uh, to her understanding, she was the 19th wife. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there was, so, there were so many and so much deception. She didn't even know which number she was. Right. Yeah. Nemo, anything you want to add about about this topic? I I have learned from sad experience that I'm not to comment on the the looks of women, so I shall. <laughs> Beautiful, yeah. <laughs> so I shall uh, abstain. I Can I just say wise. though, I feel like there's uh, something about Mormon polygamy that makes Mormon women really beautiful. I feel like when I meet women who are from. Uh, pioneer ancestors they always have like the most incredible heads of hair and just like everything about them it's I'm like, it's I'm, all that swedish dna yeah that's what like, it is. how are you guys doing this <laughs> so many good looking DNA. women that's why mormons are so tall as well oh are they yeah, yeah. oh yeah i mean have you seen me stood next to john i feel john like a child is very tall john is very tall <laughs> what what is this conversation gone? <laughs> well, we're just commenting on I'm your looks instead, John, on right? Your looks, John. <laughs> exactly. You know. <laughs> John said he hated my bangs one time, so we actually are allowed to roast his physical. We are allowed to roast John's physical. Roast roast. I've got a picture. I've got a picture that I may put online at some point of John next to a tiny little old English door. It's about four <laughs> foot tall, and it's it's like something from uh, Lilliput. It's excellent. From like Gulliver's it's like Travels. Gan it's like Gandalf showing up in the, in the in Shire. The Shire. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Anyway, uh, we back have, to the we sex have trafficking. successfully uh, digressed. Indeed. Uh, Robin wants to remind us that the pronunciation of her name is no ma I -a. Thank you, Robin. It's going to take me a while to remember that, but thanks for your support. Okay, now, Julia, you're taking us to the basic structure of sex trafficking so that then we can analyze what? Some of Joseph Smith's own marriages to see if they fit the pattern. Is that right? Yeah, so I just wanted to show this little diagram. Oh, if you'll pull it back up. Yep. Um, just to just to show, I don't know, just to see it easier. So you have the victims, which can be male and female with human trafficking. In this case, we're talking about sex trafficking. So it's usually just the women um, or it is the women. And then they are obtained by a trafficker or they have, they're under the jurisdiction of a trafficker. And then the trafficker gives those individuals to the buyer. And so I, this is just how sex trafficking works in general. And so I'm going to be using these little diagrams to showcase or to show the cases of these women who who I think or the question can be posed were these women trafficked. So yeah. And I think I can already anticipate kind of some questions here. Do missionaries or other Mormon general authorities in the 19 in the 1800s count as traffickers? And you know, if if we say buyer does that necessarily have to mean here's money for these women or can can buying be interpreted a little bit more loosely? I imagine we're going to be covering that, right? Yes. Yeah, so like, I don't know if we want to discuss it now. No, 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 we can. I'm just anticipating okay. the questions. Okay, yeah. okay. So that's the basic structure. Um, so the, the, tell us about the next slide. Joseph Smith, sex trafficker with the question mark. Okay, so one thing that I wanted to make clear is that Joseph Smith was, in my opinion, 100% a sexual predator. So we get a lot of these stories of him threatening women. We get a lot of stories of just women in general. And what I see is if he's talking to these women one-on-one, -on -one, that's not sex trafficking. If he's going directly to Zina and saying, um, I need you, uh, an angel came to me with a flaming sword and told me that if if you didn't marry me, then the angel was going to kill me. That's, that's a sexual predator. And that's not trafficking to me because there's no... I, to me, there has to be the, at least the three people or the three individuals involved. So that's what this slide is talking about is that 
we're defining or I'm defining sex trafficking as these three people, these three parties, the victim, the trafficker and the buyer. And so I just wanted to make that clear. And so I, in a lot of these cases and with the research done by Todd Compton, he calls that there and he says that there is a intermediary involved. And so that's what we're going to be showing is these these circumstances or these cases. OK, any other any other comments about this slide? I think you had it on that slide, but uh, just an, an obvious point. But just because something isn't classed as trafficking doesn't mean it's any more ethical. You know, obviously grooming, hebophilia, all, all the other st coercion, all those things are, in my mind, like sort of morally equal to human trafficking, you know, but obviously we are specifically talking about that. Got it. OK. All right. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, church history and sex trafficking. So yeah, like what you were saying with the question. So these are talking about plural wives, these older women or even young children who are 14 years old. So these are the victims. And then the traffickers can be prominent members of the church. They can be the missionaries. They can even be Joseph himself. And then the buyer is, we can talk about Joseph being the buyer. We have a lot of cases with that. We can also talk about Joseph Smith being the trafficker. So, and then the other prominent members being the buyer in this case. Yeah, cases. it can it can be his buddies, his friends, those who are in his inner circle, those who he's trying to buy their loyalty. You you could you could argue that if Joseph wanted you know loyal support in his inner circle, wives could be used as as a way to gain favor or loyalty with people he needed loyalty from. Is that right. fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, so let's go to the next slide, polygamy transactions. Okay, so I just, the reason I'm saying this is from a commenter on X Mormon Reddit is because I didn't, I didn't want to take credit for this quote because I really like it. But they say on the Joseph Smith Papers website, the church softly admits that Bushman in, is right in his conclusion that these were transactions um, involving something that it sounded awfully like payment. Having surveyed the available sources, historian Richard L. Bushman concludes that these polygamous marriage and perhaps Paul other- Andrews. Oh, sorry, Paul, excuse me. Yes, concludes that these polyandrous marriages and perhaps other plural marriages of Joseph Smith were primarily a means of binding other families to his for the spiritual benefit and mutual salvation of all involved. Okay, so, so what yeah, are you just, saying that means to you, Julia? So just the just the yeah, um the payment doesn't have to be money. It is it is usually in sex trafficking situations, but with this one, the payments can be salvation. The payments can be. Um, they are now okay to live polygamy. Um, certain wives were given uh, as payment, the exchange of women. So it doesn't have to be money. And so in these cases, it's never money. It's just other things that Joseph has. He's power things that he's holding that he can give to these people. So what I'm hearing is that, that the currency can be connection, loyalty, social capital, influence. It doesn't have to be currency, right? Exactly. Yes. Social capital, I'd say, is is a big one to keep in mind yes. here. Social mm -hmm. capital, mm -hmm. and and that's significant, right? On the frontier, like if you're in yeah. Nauvoo, if you're you know if you're wanting to be a person of status, Joseph Smith is mayor. He's commander of the legion. He's judge. He's chief cook, bottle washer. He's prophet. He he has all the power. So why wouldn't you want? Uh, and, and he needs loyalty because he's in such a powerful position. So he's a chief what? A chief Ch chief cook and bottle washer? What is that? That means everything. He's got all the power. He's doing it all, right? Okay. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. We we can't go through an episode without you using some americanism that I, I don't understand. <laughs> Also, well, I bet he's not cooking or washing bottles. <laughs> exactly. That's why he's got so many wives. Got to do that, that would be his him. attitude. Yeah. He's, you know. But he is head of the legion and mayor and prophet, right? Oh, like, I wasn't disagreeing with your point, John. I just didn't understand the example you gave. Oh yeah, yeah. King Follett sermon. He, he's king of the world. King of the world. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so Julia, now you've got what the first example? Yeah, this is my first example. With, with this is Fanny Alger or Alger. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. So, with this case, so Todd Compton says that he points out in his book perhaps the most troublesome. Um, perhaps most troublesome form of modern perspective is that it's is this the idea of the exchange of women. And he says that Smith offers Clarissa Reed to Levi Hancock in exchange for Fanny, Levi's niece, commissioning Levi to obtain Annie for him. And he says that Levi considers this assignment a mission and brings Fanny to Joseph and then is given Clarissa. 
So that's the payment. And so this is the, this person is going, being coerced or however you want to say this with Fanny. And then, and then the reward or the payment is that Levi can have this woman. Okay. So Fanny Alger is Joseph's, according to the church, Joseph Smith's first plural wife. And we're basically saying that Levi Hancock is the trafficker who delivers Fanny Alger to Joseph. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. And this is without Emma's knowledge and um, without Oliver Cowdery's knowledge, which leads Oliver Cowdery to call Joseph's relationships with Fanny a dirty, filthy, nasty affair. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That'll. That's in the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Let's go to it. Yeah. So I thought it was important to at least show the evidence that we do have or some of the evidence that we do have for um, in intimacy with Joseph and these women. And so, yeah, I like the quote that you said. In a journal or in a letter written in 1838, Oliver Cowdery writes, I did not fail to affirm that what I had said was strictly true. A dirty, na nasty, filthy, and he crossed out the word scrape and wrote a fair of his and Fanny Algers was talked over in which I was strictly declared that I had never deviated from the truth on the matter. So yeah, that's one of the things, one of the evidences. And then does somebody else want to read William McClellan's? Samantha. Yeah, William McClellan once said that... <clears throat> One night, she, Emma Smith, missed Joseph and Fanny Alger. She went to the barn and saw him and Fanny in the barn together alone. She looked through a crack and saw the transaction. She told me this story too was verily true. That's interesting because uh, Joseph Smith did not have the ceiling power that he allegedly at that point, right? Mm, yeah. nope. She's a 16 year old girl. Mm -hmm. And in DNC 132, it says that uh, Emma has to give permission for all plural wives for them to be valid. So it's pretty damning. But mm -hmm. to be fair, well, I, I can't use the phrase to be fair. The caveat is if Emma disagrees, she'll get destroyed. Yeah, bit of a yeah. catch 22. But so, she in theory, but has in theory <laughs> she must be consulted at least. Mm -hmm. Her opinion doesn't matter, but she must be consulted. Yeah, and Joseph yeah. hadn't even claimed to have the sealing uh, yeah, power the, and was yeah. certainly not sealed to Emma. But this is that euphemism I was talking about earlier comes up, you know, they talk about the transaction. Mm -hmm. Like, we know what that means. We know what they're getting at. But like it's not apologists... a little wedding ceremony with fairy lights. <laughs> yeah. But apologists will be fighting back saying, oh, well, the transaction, it could have been any number of things. Really? Could it? In the could barn? Yeah. Late at night? Swapping knitting tips? Like, uh... mm. Yeah. No. Did we read that? Do we read the final quote? Uh, no, do we, we want to have Nemo? Oh, yeah. Do we want to have yeah. Nemo read that? that? All right. This is from Wilhelm Weil. We hear that Joseph's dissolute life began already in the first times of the church in Kirtland. He was sealed there secretly to Fanny Alger. Emma was furious and drove the girl, who was unable to conceal the consequences of her celestial relation with the prophet, out of her house. What sounds does that mean? Yeah, Pregnancy? it sounds like preggers. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that there's evidence that Fanny Alger had a baby by Joseph, and I don't know that even any DNA tests have been done on her children, but we know that she got married after she left the Saints and then had children with him. So I don't know what that, to me, that sounds like she was pregnant. I don't know how, what else that would mean. But And yeah. could that be a, a John Bennett abortion situation? Oh, possibly. Yeah, because, yeah, who knows? Because John C. Bennett was the doctor that was really well versed in, um, the abortions and a lot of historians will talk about the Nauvoo abortions and one of the th research I did is that the John C. Bennett was there was a little tiny book that was talks about abortions and how to perform them and it was small so that people could um, carry it discreetly anyway so that in there there's a lot of information so yeah this could be a case of, a, of an abortion done so, especially given the sending away thing yes yeah yeah Maven writes sending women away for embarrassing pregnancies was common even up even up to now, they, the church still does that. Well, in the, in the Nauvoo Expositor, I think he even talks about women being sent away for a time and then they're brought back in. And so like that, that could be a case like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting. I haven't heard that before, but did they ever do that with Brigham onward? Because if that was sort of a unique to Joseph Smith's time thing, that feels, uh, yeah, silver bullet-esque. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so should we go to the next uh, wife? We we did Fanny Al Alger. Uh, wife isn't the right term. Uh, yeah. Let's say victim. Child victim. victim. Who's the next child victim, Julia? Okay, so Presendi, I don't think is a child. She, in fact, is married. She's a she's another uh, polyandrous union. 
So Joseph goes to Dimmick and he says, Dimmick, I want your sister Presendia. And this is a quote from, from Oliver Huntington. So I'll just read it. Oliver says, soon after Dimmick had given our sisters Zina and Presendia. So he's adding Zina in there as well, even though I didn't add her as a, as a trafficker. He says to Joseph as wife for eternity, Smith offered Dimmick any reward he wanted. Dimmick merely requested that, that where your fa where your father's family are, there I and my father's family may be also. So, so that's a transaction between Joseph and Dimmick is any reward you want. And then all Dimmick says is, you know, he says, I guess that's Ruth who says it in the Bible, where you dwell, I want to dwell as well. So that is so gross to hear Joseph using the term any reward in connection with Dimmick Huntington procuring Presendia for Joseph's polygamous transactions. Yeah. That's super disturbing. Yes, and her sister, you and said, then, Zina. What's that? that again? Yeah, Zina's yeah. Presendia's sister, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wonder if and, you know what, What's interesting is the way that he says, um, let me just find the quote exactly. He says, Dimmick merely requested that where you and your father's family are, there I and my father's family may be also. That could be a veiled reference to the idea of, well, actually, the thing I want from you is permission to do this myself, is to enter into polygamy myself. Because he's, he's, yeah. he's, it could be a veiled way of saying, well, the situation you're in, where you're getting to be polygamous, I want that too. I'm pretty sure Dimmick was, and I don't quote me on this because I didn't do the research, but I'm pretty sure Dimmick did become a plural uh, uh, husband of, he had plural wives. So that doesn't surprise me if that's what he meant by that. Mm -hmm. And I assume just wanting to secure his social status as, a, you know, a bestie of Joseph. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Really quickly, there's a comment about a comment I made. Coco writes, I think John just misspoke when he said still today the church sends them away. I'm pretty sure that there are still instances today with teenage pregnancies, unmarried pregnancies, where um, young women are encouraged to either stop going to church or they're shipped off to other states to live with family while they have the baby and then they, they come back to their, their families of origin. I'm pretty sure that still happens today. Does somebody want I, to correct I know there's me on certainly, that? I know there certainly is cases where they're forced to give up that child. Uh, and or now strongly the coerced or encouraged to give up the yeah. children, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, however you want to phrase it. But an LDS family services could play a role in, in placing that child. So, yeah. um, you know. Yeah. This is, it, it, it's not, you know, it's not the late 1800s anymore where you have to send your daughter away on a trip around Europe to conceal her pregnancy. Um, but, you know, there's still that embarrassment there. It's still a community that doesn't believe in premarital sex or, or, or whatever. So, you know, if, yeah. if, if there's a reasonable way in which someone could try and hide something that's embarrassing to their family, I don't find it hard to believe that someone would do such things. Just in the spirit of accuracy, Coco writes, I think LDS services is out of the adoption. They business. are now, I think yes. that's yeah. true, mm -hmm. but I think that's true because they don't want to let gay people adopt kids, not because they don't want to be involved in, a, in adoption services. That's my understanding. Um, okay, so we've got the second one, which is Presendia Huntington. Should we go to the third? Yeah, so this is Louisa Beeman. So this one is one of the ones that um, William Law brought out specifically where he says the banks of the Mississippi River. Um, so okay. I will just read. So I'll just read what um, Analyzer Young is saying. She says, he, Joseph Smith, then advised Joseph Bates Noble to seek a second wife for himself and to commence at once to, commence at once to build up his kingdom. He was not slow in following the prophet's advice and together the two men with their chosen celestial brides repaired one night to the banks of the Mississippi River where Joseph sealed Noble to his first plural wife, and in return, Noble performed the same office for the prophet and his sister, Louisa Beeman, his sister-in-law. These were the first plural marriages that ever took place in the Mormon church, which is not the case. We just didn't, he just wasn't aware of Fanny, or she wasn't aware of Fanny Alger. And they were obliged to be very secretly performed and kept hidden afterwards. In fact, I think Louisa Beeman was dressed as a man during this um, ceremony, in which I guess Joseph Bates Noble's wife would have been as well. So very secret. Man, so if I'm understanding this correctly, Joseph says, Joseph Smith says to Joseph Noble, you get me Louisa Beeman, and in return, I'll give you Sarah Alley. Is that right? Yeah. Uh-huh, yep. I mean, that's that's super gross. That's, that's women as chattel, and that's Joseph basically saying, <clears throat> you hook me up with another woman to have sex with, and I'll hook you up with a woman to have sex with. Yep. 
really gross. Yeah. Any other comments from the panel on that? Which makes me feel grimy inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. You've got uh, Louisa Beeman um, here, a quote from her, Julia. Yeah. Does somebody else want to read this? Uh, let's sure. do Nemo. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. In a court testimony given in 1892, Noble reported that after the marriage, he said to Smith, blow out the lights and get into bed and you will be safer there. And he took my advice. Noble, under cross-examination, clarified that he did not actually see the couple get into bed, but he, Smith, told me he did. There is no good reason to doubt that Louisa's marriage to Smith included sexuality. Noble further testified under oath, Question, where did they, Joseph and Louisa, sleep together? Answer, right straight across the river at my house, they slept together. Nemo, Again, more euphemism, More euphemisms getting in the way. Did they just go to bed together? Did they do this, do that, do that? But it seems pretty obvious that what was got to was that, because through cross-examination, they got to the idea that did they have a sexual relationship? And yes, the answer was yes. Samantha, your reaction? Yeah, obviously they had sex. He wasn't asking her about her hopes and dreams, was he? <laughs> yeah. Julia? Yeah, I don't I don't see how you can dance around that one. Joseph Joseph and Louisa were intimate together. Yeah. And why why no one can argue for me why we would assume otherwise. Why do we want to say that Brigham had sex with his wives, that John Taylor, that Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, all had sex with their polygamous wives, but somehow we want to say Joseph Smith didn't with his? Nobody can answer that question for me. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next uh, wife of Joseph that we're going to be talking about is probably one of the most revolting and disturbing, Helen Mar Kimball. Take it away, Julia. Yeah, so she's the one that the on the churches in the church's essays they say that she was just shy of fifteen. So this is the one. Yes, she's fourteen. So, who, oh, sorry. Yeah, who she is fourteen. Yeah. yeah. So from from Helen Mark Kimball, this is in her the I guess her journals or whatever. Um, she says, "My father, having a great desire to be connected with the prophet Joseph, he offered me to him. This I afterwards learned from the prophet's own mouth. My father had but one lamb, but willingly laid her upon the altar. How cruel this seemed to my mother." The prophet said to me, if you take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation and that of our father's household and all of your kindred. This promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. None but God and his angels could see my mother's bleeding heart. She saw the misery which was as sure to come as the sun was to rise and set, but it was all hidden from me. And so I really like this imagery. This She even says, she uses the word purchase. She's purchasing her family's salvation, exaltation, and all of the kindreds after her, and to to be involved in this polygamous union. This is this is very payment to me. This is very trafficking. Yeah, I don't know how to see it any other way. So basically, D Joseph Smith is offering Heber C. Kimball eternal salvation and exaltation um, for the price of his fourteen-year-old daughter, Helen Mar Kimball. Did I get that right? Yeah, I also wanted to point out, so a lot of people could argue and say, oh, these, these, or I've heard them argue, these polygamous unions were just to connect males together, to connect families. But Joseph was also, they, it was also a thing to seal men to men. So why didn't Joseph just seal himself to Heber Kimball instead of his daughter? Like, why didn't he seal himself to Dimmick Huntington and not not his sister? So this argument just falls flat to me when you when you know that they, he was doing that. He was performing sealings for, between men to make those unions. So I just think that's a really poor argument. Samantha, tell us what your nodding is saying. Yeah, I mean, it just, yeah, I just agree with what Julie is saying. I think it's absurd to claim that it was uh, in the name of anything but Joseph's lusts. And what do we make of a father? Like, I guess we don't want to be guilty of presentism. We don't want to be guilty of applying what 21st century bias to 19th century, early 19th century frontier America. What do we make of a father who's willing to give his 14 year old daughter to a prophet that's already got, I don't know, a dozen or two wives anyway? Well, what do we make of that? I mean, he's straight up like he straight up will be viewing his daughter as property that he can either give away or not. Like 
that that is the view of men of their daughters uh, in traditional Christianity. I suppose it's part of traditional Anglican wedding ceremony. It's still, the idea that the father gives the bride away, right? Um, so there's this possessive idea. Um, so I guess it was just a case of Joseph needed to give him a big enough price, like uh, a solid enough price, to um, to warrant that. But do we do we reserve our anger towards Heber or do we have compassion for Heber? I guess that's my question. I, d I don't have compassion for him uh, because ultimately he, it, this is, it's his daughter and even in the, those circumstances where he views her as property, it is his job to ensure that she is then with someone that it's you know good for her to be with when it is time for her to get married. And as a 14-year-old, it's not an appropriate time even in the day to be handing over your daughter to a man for marriage let alone a man who it's very clear isn't marrying her as his one and only but is having her as part of his harem yeah julia and then with heber c kimball i just wanted to point out this so joseph first approached heber and said that he wanted his own wife he wanted i don't know how to say her name violet or Valate. he said give me your wife and then heber went home and he was really stewing over this he had a really hard time and then he eventually came to Joseph and said, okay, you can have my wife. And then Joseph said, that was just a test and you passed it. But what the real test is that you need to give me your daughter. So I wonder, if, just in a sense of understanding in Hebrew and where he's coming from, I would imagine that he felt a sense of relief that he doesn't have to give up his wife, but that he could instead put his daughter in, in the target as for Joseph. So I, I don't know, that just a, a sense of understanding that why he would do this and why he would... But we know that Joseph, he's he's very involved in polygamy and he becomes one of the one of the chosen to live polygamy. So and we'll see more of that later. So I don't know. I have compassion and I'm upset at Brigham or I mean, upset at Heber and have understanding for him. So that's a it's a hard place to put my emotions yeah. for Heber. But then equally, there's a story that I, I'm looking to tell at some point, but I may as well talk about it here. The story of Mary Smithies, the first child born in the church in the UK. Mary Smithies was blessed at the at the at two weeks old. She was blessed by Heber C. Kimball. So he held this two week old baby in his arms and blessed her um, as the first child born into the church. Nineteen years later, she would become his polygamous wife. Mm. So this man's relationship with you know with polygamy, it, it, it's. It's it's hard to have sympathy for him in that sense when you go to see the things that he would do under polygamy and the sort of grimy stuff that he'd get involved with. Yeah, and I, I just did a episode with uh, Randy Bell on Heaven's Gate and how uh, Marshall Applewhite convinced 39 people to all die with him in sort of this religious cult-like suicide um, pact involving, you know, alleged spaceships. And so I guess I guess we we shouldn't put it past a cult leader to to be able to um, demand and extract extreme devotion from from their followers. And uh, if if Marshall Applewhite or Jim Jones can convince dozens or hundreds of their followers to kill themselves, then I guess it's not a stretch to think that Joseph could exact um, a, a male follower. To, to provide his 14 year old daughter to Joseph. I mean, that's just the way mm -hmm. undue influence works. Yeah, maybe well, I'm then, just not being kind. Go on, sorry. I was just gonna no, say, no. even with, with your Heaven's Gate thing, they, they targeted people like it, with high IQs. So intelligent people are joining cults like that. And so we can't, I don't know, like everyone's susceptible. Everyone can be susceptible to, to these types of teachings and, mm -hmm. and cult-like organizations. And they say that highly intelligent people are able to rationalize these things better. So when when contradictory yeah. evidence comes up that their cult isn't true, they're actually better able to formulate reasons why they should remain in the cult. They're, they're right. better able to feed their confirmation bias. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are going to argue, again, that Helen Mark Kimball, even though she was 14, didn't actually have sex with Joseph Smith. We've already beat down that dumb defense, you know, but but let's go ahead and address the evidence that Joseph and Helen Mark Kimball did have sex. Go ahead, Julia. Yes. So she, in her books, and in this was one of these was published in the Juvenile Instructor. She defines polygamy herself. So she says it was revealed to the latter that there were thousands of spirits yet unborn who were anxiously waiting for the privilege of coming down to take tabernacles of flesh, that their glory might be complete, which makes this plural wife system an actual necessity. So she is saying 
the reason for polygamy is to give these spirits bodies like that's it full stop that's yeah. why we have polygamy and that's what the book of mormon it's says as well such a silver bullet because she is someone that lived polygamy she is a first-time witness to polygamy and if she's saying that in her understanding polygamy is for bringing spirits down into bodies that she's responsible for creating with her husband then why would anyone else have any uh, any argument to say she wasn't having sex with joseph smith because her understanding of what polygamy was a system that she was involved in was that it was for having sex and bringing up children yep exactly. let's go on let's read the second quote julia uh, she also wrote, the principle was established by the prophet Joseph Smith, and all who have entered into it in righteousness have done so for the purpose of raising a righteous seed. And the object is that we may be restored back to that Eden from whence we fell. And then again, she, write, she wrote, I would never have been sealed to Joseph had I known it was anything more than ceremony. I was young and they deceived me by saying the salvation of our whole family depended upon it. Just before we get to that last quote, can I just throw something in there about that middle one which is the idea that joseph established the principle which could fly under the radar but i'm sure i'm not the only one that would notice this the principle is a euphemism used at that time and still used now by fundamentalist groups to mean polygamy um, and again it's all about these euphemisms that we used to try and hide it at the time they would talk about it as the principle but there are you know the apostolic united brethren amongst and other polygamist fundamentalist groups use the term the principle to mean if you're living the principle it means you're living polygamously Right. Yeah, for some reason, I did not realize that last quote from Helen, where she says, had I known it was anything more than ceremony, I would have never been sealed to Joseph. That implies that she ended up regretting her being sealed to Joseph Smith. Am I reading that right? Interpreting that right or not? So that's what it sounds like. So this that was published in 1948. So just a few years after Joseph Smith's death. But I think she was, I think Helen Moore Kimball was one of the ones that people point to to say she always defended polygamy. So like this was this, that was an earlier quote or an earlier source, whereas maybe later she defended it. So like, yes, like I can imagine to some degree she did because that's what that quote is saying. But then I think, I think later she did defend it. And I think that, that people have to do that. These wives have to do that to make, to make it make sense, to make this okay. Like the sunk cost kind of thing. Yeah. I'm always troubled by the apologetic that the wives, the polygamous wives spoke highly of polygamy, so it must not have been a bad or an immoral thing. Like, I can't even get the family of prophets and general authorities who no longer believe in the church to come on Mormon Stories podcast because they're so afraid of the familial and social consequences of speaking up. I cannot imagine what it would be like for a 19th century century plural wife to to denounce openly polygamy is a bad thing the social pressure to speak highly about polygamy or to stay silent about it must have been just overwhelming am i wrong no i agree yeah i would agree we've got someone saying that it's not helen's own words uh, in that last quote is it reported speech from um that catherine it's catherine woman? lewis yeah. Well, so Catherine Lewis says she's quoting her, so yeah. I guess you could. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, but no, it's, I mean, it's just it's, you know, it's a it's a source just as good as any other, and it's just reported speech. You know, we have plenty of those examples throughout church history. Someone writing what someone said to them. Yeah, and it's a fair point, but of course, the Mormon Church won't hesitate to use a quoted reference if it's to their benefit. So we I have believe to. They've remember. used Catherine Lewis to their benefit in the past as well. They, they've tried to undermine her as a source, but I'm pretty sure they've used her to support their arguments. And William Clayton and, and Martin William Harris Clayton, yeah. and Oliver Cowdery and, you know, David Whitmer. Like, there are all sorts of sources that the church will embrace when it's positive and then denounce, you know, when it's negative, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next plural wife of Joseph Smith, which is Almera Johnson. Go ahead, Julia. Okay, so does someone want to read in the voice of Benjamin with the with this i guess that would be nemo oh the voice of benjamin okay mm -hmm. sure right so that's uh let me just make sure that's almira johnson okay really quick I, really quick set up the structure so that then okay. we know who benjamin is julia okay, so benjamin so benjamin's the brother and joseph goes to benjamin and, and says i need i want your sister almira and benjamin's uh this is benjamin's response which i think is really really interesting okay and then there's more i want to talk about on the slide but i want to hear benjamin first so well, go to Nemo, All I right. guess. Okay. Benjamin. I sincerely believed him to be a prophet of God, and I loved him as such. 
and also for the many evidences of his kindness to me. Yet such was the force of my education, and the scorn that I felt towards anything unvirtuous, that under the first impulse of my feelings I looked him calmly but firmly in the face, and told him that I had always believed him to be a good man, and wished to believe it still, and would try to, and that I would take for him a message to my sister, and if the doctrine was true, all would be well. But if I should afterwards learn that it was offered to insult or prostitute my sister, I would take his life. Ouch. And then, and then the last line. Yeah. With a smile, Joseph, he replied, Benjamin, you will never see that day, but you shall live to know that it is true and rejoice in it. Yeah. So I, I just really like that line because it seems like Benjamin, to some degree, had a hunch of what was going on. He's like, if I've learned that you're prostituting my sister, I'm going to kill you, is essentially what he's saying. And then Joseph's reassuring him that that's not the case. And if you go back to this slide, I wanted to point out another situation which could have been uh, one, a case for trafficking. Um, I put a note down here that says, Joseph also asked Benjamin for his 15-year-old sister, Esther, but she was already engaged. And so I guess Joseph is either um, fearing Benjamin or he's somehow he's drawing the line with this engaged woman, although he's never drawn any lines before with women who are already married or or engaged. With Zionist, she was going to marry Henry Jacobs. And anyway, so I don't know what caused him to draw that line with Esther, but I just thought that was an interesting thing to point out that, that he wanted Almira's sister as well. I think having a man turn around and say, like, if you do anything unvirtuous with my sister, I'm going to kill you, might make him my... question it. But then Joseph Smith isn't a man known to know his own boundaries. Yeah, He's not a man to know when it should stop, hence ordering the destruction of a printing press that puts him in jail, hence denying the federal troops to be allowed into a city. Again, sending him to jail, right? So he's not a man who knows when to stop, really, but for some reason he did. Right. Sammy? Yeah, I mean, h hard to know. I, I do think it's, I do think the, the brother threatening him might be a piece of it. Maybe he's feeling like it's already, uh, you know, has the potential to be rocky or to catch him out. So he's like, I won't push it on that one. Seems like that's just going to make my life more difficult. I imagine it would all just be through the lens of like, what's going to make my life the easiest. I'm just going to note that, you know, I'm in a, I'm, I'll just be candid as a podcaster, as someone who has some public notoriety and some influence, you know, the Open Stories Foundation of Mormon Stories has some limited power and money and influence. I just can't imagine going to you, Nemo, or you, Samantha, or you, Julia, and saying, hey, I want your siblings or your children as polygamous concubines. Can you guys hook me up? Like, that's just a level of boldness that is just really hard to comprehend pulling off. I, am I, I overstating that? I can confirm publicly I have never received such a communication <laughs> from John Dolin. You also haven't uh, built your whole thing on fantastical claims or magical thinking, which certainly helps. And obviously back then people are even more prone to magical thinking. So you don't have like the right kind of foundation with the people that support you. I mean, I'm sure you, uh, you know, anyone with sort of power and influence probably could exploit certain people. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like that's that was Joseph Smith's, his whole charismatic, uh, presumably narcissistic, whatever energy was, was kind of apparent from the beginning. So the people that are following him are the people that you know, are vulnerable to that type of presentation, whereas you present quite differently. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, I've gotten in trouble for saying before that it should be illegal to claim that you speak to God and that you speak for God. But, you know, th there's this phrase, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I think we could also conclude that extraordinary claims lead to extraordinary abuses. And, and uh, you know, whether it's Chad and Lori Daybell, whether it's Jim Jones, Marshall Applewhite, you know, Warren Jeffs, as soon as you claim to be the voice and mouth of God, you yourself or people under your influence and power uh, just far too often do horrific things. And so I just think we should have built within society you know, just like just like we have certain medical assumptions and certain social assumptions, like children shouldn't have sex with each other, like, you know, incest laws. I just think that we should learn as a society 
that that nobody should publicly claim they speak to God because it's almost a guarantee that extraordinary abuses are, are going to follow. That's just what I think. It's tough because some people genuinely do believe that they do. And you obviously don't want to like punish people for certain mental illnesses. Or I, I, It's like murky with, you know, making it illegal. But I mean, I think like the type of work you're doing is like spreading aware and Stephen Hassan comes to mind, like just uh, making the information more ubiquitous of like, this is what undue influence looks like. How about how about you can believe it, but just don't talk about it or you can believe it. <laughs> but just don't. <laughs> You don't go, get go to ahead. have a, a tax exemption for your organization based on it. Yeah, you don't get to amass massive wealth and power mm -hmm. around your claims that then just compounds your influence with people, right? Yeah, it's it's kind of shocking that uh, an organization being built on the back of magical claims gives it more privileges under the law than sort of a regular organization. Yeah. Yeah, rather than saying it should be illegal to claim you speak for God, it should be illegal to make money on the back of a claim that you speak for God. Mm. You shouldn't yeah. be allowed to take in money on, based on that fact. And that would undermine, because the money becomes the power in lots of ways. It allows people to then buy a ranch where they can then isolate themselves. It allows people to, you know, sustain it, sustain yeah. these communities, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. All right, Julia, back to Almera Johnson and Benjamin Johnson. Anything else you want to say about that? Um, I just wanted to point out the payment for that was that Joseph allowed Benjamin Johnson to live polygamously. And I think this was this was heard that um, Todd Compton had, had trouble finding any evidence for their sexual relationship. Although uh, you could argue that with a lot of people, there isn't sexual evidence for sexual relationships. He did say that there is a possibility that one of her kids um, could have been Joseph's, but was most likely belonged to her husband. So... So there's that, but yeah, the, the, the payments for sure was that Benjamin was able to live, uh, to have polygamous wives himself, so. Yeah, yeah, that just seems to be a common part. It's, you get me wives and I'll get you wives. You yeah, know, scratch basically. my back, I'll scratch yours. Yeah, you get me sex, I'll get you sex. Um, okay, and and speaking of sex, let's talk about uh, the evidence or lack thereof of Almira Johnson and intimacy. Um, okay, so that, so, so, the, so the wife that, that I just referenced was probably not her. There's one of them that I, that there was, uh, Todd Compton was struggling to get evidence for that, but they, yeah. So let me read these ones. Okay. Um, okay. So Almira Johnson in her affidavit on, on August 1st, 1883, she said, I had been fearing and doubting about the principal. And so, ha and so had he, but he now knew it was true. After this time, I lived with the prophet Joseph Smith as his wife. And he visited me at the home of my brother, Benjamin F at Mace Macedonia. And then yeah, Benjamin so Smith, like immediately, I lived with Joseph Smith as his wife, and he visited me at the home of my brother. Mm -hmm. That sounds like sex to me. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you I know, know you agree, long, yeah. Samantha. Yeah, you're because, nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To say as my wife is the euphemism for we're having sexual relations. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, uh, go ahead and continue, Julia. Yeah, and then Benjamin goes on to clarify. He says, on the 15th of May, some three weeks later, the prophet again came at, and at my house occupied the same room and bed with my sister. So again, um, evidence that he and Elmira were intimate together. And I guess people could argue, well, maybe they just like put put pillows between them and had a little dividing line. So they shared the same bed, but didn't have sex. But then why would they be making that argument? Um, you know, when, when there's no reason to believe that that's, what would have happened he had a mansion house yeah. he had plenty of other beds they could have occupied yeah probably don't even need to be in a bed if it's not going to be <laughs> sexual yeah. you yeah, know yeah. you think they'd be yeah. all knowing enough to avoid any the appearance of evil avoid the appearance <laughs> of evil <laughs> i'm reminded of the family that i grew up with when they went to astro world and amusement park they were so worried about drinking a cup that said Coca-Cola, even though they were drinking Sprite, <laughs> they were so worried about drinking a cup that said Coca-Cola that the family stood in a circle so that they would drink the beverage from the inside of the circle so that no one outside would think that they, they, was, that they were possibly drinking Coca-Cola. They did a circle of, of trust <laughs> over Coca-Cola. That's wild. That's giving scrupulosity. Wow. <laughs> and yet Joseph Smith was sleeping in the same bed with women, and we want to believe that he wasn't having sex with them. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've had a request from the chat to stop using the word intimacy when we talk about sex. Um, <laughs> it, it's difficult point. with YouTube's algorithm and, and, and all that and sort of stuff. Want, you say that word too many times. And if I want to make sure instead of it later, I don't want to have to edit myself out. So that's yeah. probably why I'm doing it. Um, so, okay. But yeah. just to be clear, that is what we mean when we talk about intimacy. I think everyone, having watched this video for two hours now, should be very clear that that is what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's another super powerful slide. Again, just occupied the same room in bed with my sister. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he could even utter those words without getting super furious. But let's go. He sounds to like the a man next... prone to anger. Yeah. Let's go to the next victim, which is Emily Partridge. Do you want to set up the structure for us, Julia? Yeah. So this is one of those unique situations where Joseph uses one of his widow wives, Elizabeth Durfee, as the as what you can classify as the trafficker. So, Elizabeth, so Joseph went to Elizabeth and said, hey, help me get, get Emily. Go and talk to her and tell her to come meet me. And, and I want to talk to her about her becoming my polygamous wife. So Elizabeth then, so we can read these quotes from her. Um, so she, so Compton points out, even those unsympathetic to Joseph will understand that Elizabeth, like all Mormon women, had accepted him as an infallible leader and that it was, and that it was the intensity of her religi religiosity that led her to influence other women to enter polygamy. And so um, this is the only case that I pulled out with these four widows that he married. Um, but I, you could argue that he married these women to help him traffic other women. But this is the only one I pulled out. But Emily wrote, Mrs. Durfee came to me one day and said, Joseph would like an opportunity to talk with me. And I asked her if she knew what he wanted. She said she thought he wanted me for, for a wife. I was to meet him in the evening at Mrs. Kimball's. And Joseph and Emily were married that night. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. It, All right, Nemo. The, the role of these older women. I mean, these these older women. Not to get crass about female biology or whatever, but some of these older women are beyond childbearing years, and so already in marrying them as polygamous brides, Joseph's in contravention of DNC one thirty two, which says it's for the bearing up of the souls of men. So he shouldn't be marrying them anyway. But I think Julie is very right when she talks about how he's marrying them to use them then to control the other brides because you have these almost matriarchal. Um, women in these polygamous marriages if they get big enough you have the older wives that school the younger wives and teach them how to behave and, and all these sorts of things exactly yeah and then answering the question of whether Emily Partridge if there's evidence for sex not on uh, just intimacy between Joseph Smith and Emily Partridge we have a transcript from the Temple Lot case where Emily Partridge was questioned Nemo, what if you play the Inquisitor and Samantha, you play the respondent? Would that work? Sounds great. Is that all right, Samantha? Yes. All right, go Perfect. for it, Nemo. <clears throat> Had you roomed with him prior to the night after you were married the last time? No, sir, not roomed with him. Well, had you slept with him? Yes, sir. Had you slept with him before the 4th of March, 1843, their marriage date? No, sir. Did you ever live with Joseph Smith after you were married to him after that first night that you roomed together? No, sir. Emma knew that we were married to him, but she never allowed us to live with him. Do you make the declaration now that you ever roomed with him at any time? Yes, sir. Do you make the declaration that you ever slept with him in the same bed? Yes, sir. How many nights? One. Only one night? Yes, sir. Then you only slept with him in the same bed one night? No, sir. Did you ever have carnal intercourse with Joseph Smith? Yes, sir. Oh, I feel like a Mormon bishop. That's really grimy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, sorry, Samantha. Thank you for doing that. Um, I, I'm sorry. That's awkward. But that's also the, the facts, right? I mean, that's pretty explicit. How's anybody going to argue with that exchange? You know, uh, believe yeah. the women. If we're going to believe women... I mean, this is one that that might be worth believing. I don't know. Samantha, what's your reaction as you read that that exchange? I mean, I believe her. I have no reason not to. It's yeah. it's embarrassing for women at that time to talk about sex at all. And I, I think it would uh, be a massive net negative for them to admit something like this. Like, you know, you, you obviously hear those claims of these women are just... Uh, I don't know, trying to get something out of it. But I, there's nothing in it for women at that time to admit that they slept with another man they hadn't slept with. No, there's only, only social stigma them. and shame and, yeah. and the lack of prospect of a, another marriage yeah. down the line or whatever. Yeah. 
Julie, any reactions for you from that exchange? I, I think I've heard people say that these women, this is a Temple Lock case, and I heard, I've heard people say that these women were under a lot of pressure and they could have answered incorrectly. But like, I, I, there's no reason to doubt it. Like we said, the default of polygamy is that they were having sex together. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, that was unsavory. That was not my favorite part of the podcast. No, yeah. not enjoyable. All right. Well, if that weren't enough, there's more. I mean, there's so many of these. Like we're going through a lot, but I guess we're trying, we're trying to provide evidence, right, Julia? So, yeah, yeah. so the next one is Sarah and Whitney as the victim. Do you want to set up the structure, Julia? Yeah. So Joseph goes to the parents this time, Newell and Elizabeth, and says, "Hey, I want your daughter." Sarah Ann and the the what happens is what comes out of this is the the a July 1842 revelation and Nemo in Joseph Smith voice uh, would you read this the revelation yeah absolutely Joseph Smith received a revelation on July of 1842 that reads verily thus saith the Lord unto my servant N.K. Whitney the thing that my servant Joseph Smith has made known unto you and your family which you have agreed upon is right in mine eyes and shall be rewarded upon your heads with honour and immortality and eternal life to all your house, both old and young, because of the lineage of my priesthood, saith the Lord. It shall be upon you and upon your children after you from generation to generation, by virtue of the holy promise which I now make unto you, saith the Lord. Um, am I the only one that's hearing the temple in that? There's a lot of language there from the temple ceilings, um, and generally... For all yeah. generations, yeah. For all generations, yeah. sealed upon you by virtue of my promise, all these sorts of things. Yeah, now, is that is that enshrined in the Doctrine and Covenants, what you just read? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, it's on Joseph Smith Papers. If you just type this in, it, it shows up. And I'm pretty sure, I don't know what section it is, but yeah, it's definitely in the Doctrine and Covenants. Oh, uh, that's, yeah. I, I, but it's not acknowledged in the Doctrine and Covenants as as being what, what the what the subject of the topic is is that correct right i mean he doesn't say anywhere in there that it's about polygamy but we know that's what it is and he says he talks about he alludes to how they've already talked about it and and i really like the line where he says um that it is right in my eyes so he's he's be, joseph is taking the voice of god saying that polygamy is right in my eyes and the payment or the reward is honor and immortality and eternal life for all of you uh, for your house both old and young and yeah so this is this is where I think traditional mainstream Christians get really mad at the Mormon Church and Joseph Smith, because they claim that that Mormonism ruins people for God. Because here it's not just Joseph, uh, you know, giving offering a payment in exchange for sex with women, but it's Jesus Christ Himself, right? I mean, the the God of the Doctrine and Covenants, according to Mormonism, is Jesus Christ. So it's Jesus who's offering eternal life, immortality to, you know, this entire family in exchange for letting Joseph have sex with Sarah and Whitney. Am I overstating that, Julia? I don't think you are. I think like, yeah, they're taking, he's taking on the voice of Jesus and, and saying these horrible things that Jesus did not stand for. And this is all like leads to the happiness letter and the idea of Joseph Smith being able to switch into the voice of God quite easily to kind of get what he wants out of these situations. And so this is one of those expedient revelations that Joseph receives where, oh, yeah, God says that what I've just said to you is totally justified. Um, by the way, thus saith the Lord. It's kind yeah. of like not to be flippant, but he, he has, as we've gone over in the LDS discussions episodes, he has this habit of getting expedient revelation as and when he needs to back up his position with a deity in force. Samantha, are you feeling any any reaction to that part? No, it's just well said, Nemo. Yeah. All right, and let's jump to, uh, again, the question of whether there's evidence for intimacy. Do you want to cover that, Julia? Yeah, the following month, Joseph wrote a letter dated the 18th, oh, I didn't put the month, um, August of 1842 to the Whitney parents, telling them that it was God's will that they and Sarah come and visit him. He even assured them that he had a room to all to himself and told them to avoid being seen by Emma at all costs. And finally, he instructs them to burn the letter after reading it. Three days after doing this for Joseph, he seems to reward Newell with instructions to take another wife or wives. Wow. So, yeah, like he, Joseph in his letter, he was like, hey, I've got a room to myself and don't be seen by Emma. Like, in fact, he, I think he's very specific on the time and day that they should come and to avoid Emma. 
and and bring your daughter with you. And he, yeah, it's just awful. And then the the, burn, the instruction to burn the letter is very similar to the happiness letter. What's really interesting to me, like like you said about the happiness letter and, and things, he employed in, in the case of the happiness letter, I believe he employed Sarah Hyde, Orson Hyde's wife, who he'd taken as a polygamous bride. He employed her as one of these sort of helper wives to then try and get Nancy uh, Rigdon involved. But how he managed to do all this without Emma, like how he managed to do all this without his first and most public wife, um, the one that he's the only one he's legally married to, how he managed to do all this without her help and assistance he did it through this system of other women and uh male relations keeping it all secret from his his wife for the most part until it then comes out she tries to have some control over it and he basically rides roughshod over her i don't understand how he managed to do it just a thought i feel like a lot of what uh cult leaders are able to get away with is very surprising i know they obviously had like no technology back then that would uh make it way harder now but i feel like you always you know when you hear about keith ranieri or other leaders of these types of groups that they're they're just so relentless in their lying in their schemes but for whatever reason people don't pick up on it for way longer than you would think that they would it's almost like the brazenness of of them and their lying kind of gets them through for longer or something yeah maybe it's just or it's, it's that whole thing of like act like you belong so yeah. you know, when you walk into a, a to a building where you know you shouldn't be, if you act like you belong, people don't question you. And I, I've been thinking lately, there's almost like this level of lying that is so out there that you almost wouldn't consider that it might be a lie. Because you're like, if someone was lying, they wouldn't go that far. I don't know if that's like a phenomenon <laughs> coming into play. Because it just sounds so extreme. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, God told me you need to give me your daughter. But the weird, The weird psychological dynamic is that soci sociologists have determined that the more that you require, the more sacrifice, if you're a cult leader, the more sacrifice you require of your followers, the more devoted and loyal they're gonna be. So it works the opposite way that we think. The more outrageous the, the sacrifice that is requested, the more devotion you exact. Haven't they even found uh, on a smaller level uh, in psychology that if if you ask someone who only kind of likes you to do something for you that's a, a little bit out of their comfort zone, usually people will do the thing and then their brains will create more of a story about why they like you. So weirdly enough, asking people for things that are, you know, asking them to like ex overextend themselves a little bit for you can almost solidify their opinion of you in a way that is favorable. <laughs> Yeah. It's like you believe in them, like you, yeah. you have faith in their ability to, to go above and beyond for you. And again, there's there's several kind of silver bullet slides, but this slide is so gross because he's basically wanting Sarah to come to him. The parents are involved. He has a room all by himself, but he's telling her, don't tell Emma. That's so disrespectful and deceitful to Emma. And then he's saying, burn the evidence. Um, you know, that's just all, it's unsavorable for anyone, but it's particularly unsavorable for, for someone who claims to be literally God and Jesus's representative on the earth, you know, obey me and give me your money and your time and your power. It's just so gross. Um, all right. Uh, so Julia, let's go to the next slide. Now I thought, oh, phew, we're finally done with Joseph's wives, but there's a, there's a couple more, but we have a little bit of an interlude where you have a slide about Joseph yes, Smith as trafficker. But wait, yeah, there's so before, more. Yeah, so before I was discussing Joseph as this type of buyer, although although I do list him as a trafficker too, because it's unique, because he's, because he's as the one benefiting from these unions, he's going to someone else so that they can get the thing that he can benefit. And so he's sort of the trafficker and the buyer. So it's kind of a weird way to define it. But with these next ones, Joseph Smith is the trafficker and someone else is the one benefiting from these polygamous unions. So that's a really Oh, wow. Okay. So this is the one of, these aren't Joseph's wives. These are wives right. that Joseph, you're saying maybe trafficked other men. Yes, exactly. All right. All right. So go ahead. Uh, do, who do we want to read this, Julia? Um, I can just read some of them. Okay, so, go for it. Go for it. So Joseph gave, uh, so from, I don't know how to say this person's name, Bergera. Um, Gary Bergera. 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 They yeah. say that Joseph Smith gave permission to 28 men to live celestial marriage or polygamy. And such unions had to be sanctioned by Joseph Smith. And if you were caught living spiritual wifery, 
um, which is basically the same thing like we said, but without Joseph's permission, then you were punished, just like those of William or W. W. Phelps and John C. Bennett. And in these cases of celestial marriage, Joseph giving women to certain male members of the church, it can be argued that, that Joseph was the trafficker. And what I another thing that I think was interesting is that under Brigham Young, he made it okay for every man to he he said everyone should be a every man should be a polygamist, and that's how you can have higher glory in heaven. And then it, so everything became the same thing: spiritual life, free polygamy. It sort of all became the same with, under Brigham. I just thought yeah. that was interesting to know that Joseph mm -hmm. was very select in who lived polygamy, and then Brigham was just open that up because. And then I guess in, it's. It's down to where they were, right? So Joseph Smith's kind of under the purview of the U.S. government when he's trying to practice right. polygamy, so he's got to keep a secret, whereas Brigham's purposely run off to the Rocky Mountains so that he can basically be open and free with this stuff. And so, yeah, then every, then it's game on for everyone because it's like, well, this is this is finally able to be part of foundationally what it means to be one of us. This is something you've got to be willing to take on to be part of the in-group. So it, it becomes a an expansive sort of idiomatic thing to Mormonism that helps people feel special and unique and bonded to the the group. I would have thought. Yeah. Meanwhile, so these other men that, are just complicit for Joseph. Go on, John. Sorry. Right. No, that's good. So, Julie, tell us about this next slide. Joseph Smith was in charge of polygamy. What you're saying here? So, so just there was a publication in the Times and Seasons, I think, um, where this guy Solomon Freeman he was living with another woman and so presumably the same thing but joseph didn't give him the okay and he's part of the quorum of the 70s so joseph he, they said you were guilty of polygamy and they he, i think he was kicked out of the 70s so i just wanted to put the slide just to say that joseph was the one sort of like warren jess is the one who was in charge of every relationship in the rlds church or the flds church joseph was that guy here he was the one so solely the one in charge of who can and cannot live polygamy I, I do, you wanna, do we want to read those quotes I don't, I, um, do you think that'd be beneficial or it, I just wanted to point that out specifically. Okay. Well, I'll just say that when I learned about Warren Jeffs, I was deeply disturbed by the, I mean, it's all disturbing, but I was extra deeply disturbed that like he was taking wives, you know, if, if one of his male followers who was practicing polygamy fell out of favor, that that Warren would literally like excommunicate those men, kick them out of the tribe, and then reassign those wives to other men, or men would bring their daughters to Warren Jeffs, and then it would be Warren Jeffs who would reward men who did his bidding with, with the wives of Warren Jeffs choosing. I found that so disturbing and it was extra disturbing when I realized he was literally just following Joseph's playbook. And if you read DNC 132, where it talks about polygamous virgin wives as chattel, it's, it's all over DNC 132, where it talks about women being and wives being reassigned to other men if they misbehave. And I, I guess that was a real aha moment for me that you, it's really hard to find something heinous that Warren Jeffs did that he didn't learn from Joseph Smith, other than maybe having sex with the, with the, with the young girls during the temple ceremony. That's about the only thing I can find Warren Jeffs did that Joseph Smith didn't, that we know of. Uh, and I think and this comes back to as well the whole um, having a kind of a public scapegoat or, or something. So you've got these newspapers in the UK going on about polygamy. They know what's going on um, even before the Nauvoo Expositor. And then someone that Joseph falls out of favor with, he can cast off and say, yep, we've kicked him out for practicing that horrible polygamy thing you're accusing us all of. It's almost it presents this image to the outside world that we're rooting out polygamy from within our ranks. We're getting rid of it. We're sorting the problem that you're accusing us of. Anyone we find practicing it, we're getting rid of. Uh, meanwhile, Joseph's still practicing it secretly. So this idea that he's condemning polygamy is very, um, very expedient to him because he can use it as a way to, to publicly show that they're distancing themselves from it. All right. Well, let's jump to these uh, final instances of Joseph Smith as trafficker. Uh, the first one is Sarah Peak Noon. Go ahead, Julia. Yeah. So Joseph went to Heber C. Kimball. So I have some things I want to read, but he went to Heber C. Kimball and was like, hey, you need to marry this woman, Sarah Peak Noon. And I just want to read a little bit. So Joseph taught Heber about polygamy 
And Heber at first thought of marrying two older women that would cause, quote, little if any unhappiness, unquote, for his wife. However, Joseph had already picked out a, a wife for Heber. For Heber. Her name was Sarah Peak Noon, and she was the 35-year-old woman from England, a convert. Additionally, Joseph forbade Heber from telling his own wife of the arrangement. And according to Orson Pratt, Heber was told by Joseph that if he did not do this, he would lose his apostleship and be damned. And then Todd Compton goes on to say that so often Joseph Smith taught polygamy as a requirement and to reject it was to lose one's eternal soul. Once he had accepted him as a prophet, one had to comply or accept a damnation. What was the benefit for Joseph of him forcing Heber to take that 35 year old woman? Is it just that he like wanted to, them to be in the same sort of company so that uh, they were more in it together? Like. Why did he care if she married if he married the older woman? Is it a bit or... of a mutually assured destruction type thing where yeah. like once thinking. Joseph gets him in a polygamous relationship, then if he tries to out Joseph, her, yeah. he can out him. It reminds me of the Scientology auditing. You know, when L. Ron Hubbard would audit, you know, the new members, they would basically just get them alone with someone to confess all their dirt. It also reminds me of Keith Raniere getting some of his women concubines to send him sexually um, uh, compromising photos. Once you have dirt, like you said, Nemo, on somebody, it's mutually assured dis destruction. I think that's a great way to characterize it. Heber C he wanted Heber C. Kimball in on it so that he wasn't vulnerable to Heber C. Kimball ratting him out later. Mm -hmm. And this is why if you look at the slide, uh, it says buyer next to Heber C. Kimball, if you go to the, the previous slide. But there's a question mark there because it's like, well, was he a buyer or was this kind of forced upon him? Because Joseph basically said, if you don't, you lose all your position. So it, it's a bit of a strange relationship there. It's not as simple as, I want a polygamous wife, go out and get me one. It's Joseph as the trafficker enforcing his trafficked product onto someone. And that's just a bit of a strange relationship. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really, this is just really troubling, and uh, it's just hard to believe that people can behave this way, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, and and again, let's go ahead and uh, talk about any evidence that Sarah Peak Moon had sex with Heber C. Kimball. Yeah, so they had kids together. So they had four kids, and they had their first one, um, uh, how do you say the name? Adelbert? Adelbert. Adelbert was born in 1842 and Henry was born in 1844. And I highlighted those ones just because this is during Joseph Smith's lifetime while he was alive. And so why would Joseph, again, why would Joseph not have sex with these women, but allow these other men to have sex with their wives? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yep. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and jump. I think this may be the final example. Is that right? There, I think there's two more. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this is this is Martha. The penultimate. Brothers. This is the penultimate example of trafficking. <laughs> Go ahead. Go okay, ahead, so Julia. This is one. This is one that John, that uh, uh, William Law talked about in the novel Expositor when he when he pointed out the circumstances of the one where it says positively no admittance. So, um, does someone else want to read the notes that we have for Martha? Sure. So, Can do. So, yeah. From John C. Bennett, we hear the story of Martha Brotherton. Miss Brotherton is a very good-looking, amiable, and accomplished English lady of highly respectable parentage, cultivated intellect, and spotless moral character. She was selected as one of the victims for the cloister in order to be consecrated to apostolic brutality. In her own words, she goes on to say that, When we reached the building, he led me up some stairs to a small room, the door of which was locked, and on it the following inscription, Positively no admittance. She goes in and is introduced to Joseph by Brigham, except immediately afterwards Joseph leaves and Brigham Young locks her in the room with him. Brigham tells her of polygamy and proposes that they get married that day. With no luck, Brigham has Joseph return and they both proceed to try and convince her of polygamy. Joseph stated that, If you will accept Brigham, you shall be blessed. God shall bless you, and my blessing shall rest upon you. And if you will be led by him, you will do well. You will do well, for I know Brigham will take care of you. And if he don't do his duty to you, Come to me, and I will take him. And if you do not like it in a month or two, come to me, and I will make you free again. And if he turns you off, I will take you on. Martha does not end up marrying Brigham. 
Yeah, How so did she get away with that? I have no I, idea. I don't know. Um, but yeah, this is from John C. Bennett's History of the Saints. And I and just pointing out that she was from England. She's a, a convert from across the ocean. And the, the note on Joseph Smith's office door that says pos positively no admittance. And then just this, these two men are trying to convince her to live it. And she keeps asking for more time. And then eventually, I think she just sort of, it sort of seems like or sounds like she sort of goes to him and she, because he gets distracted with other women. And then so she doesn't end up having to marry him. But this whole thing, so this was not a, a successful, I guess you could say successful trafficking um, transaction, but it was set up to potentially be one. And I can just hear Mormon apologists saying, well, you can't trust John C. Bennett as a source because he was kicked out of the church. I would say, like William Law, like John C. Bennett, like Oliver Cowdery, um, ex-Mormons that were whistleblowers who were contemporaries with Joseph Smith, I think are among our best sources for truthful information, not our least reliable sources. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. I'd say so. All right. Because they're out from under Joseph's spell. And they were there, right? Mm -hmm. And they left They left for good reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they, they were there and they left for good reasons. So they're whistleblowers of integrity, not uh, malcontents to be dismissed, in my mm -hmm. view. All right, I think we've got the last one, Julia. Yeah, so I'll, I'll read this story. This is, this is from a journal um, or an article by John, George D. Smith. He says, by the time William Clayton first mentions plural marriage in the early 1843, he had been married to his legal wife, Ruth, for six years, and they had three children together. Smith called at his home one day and invited Clay for a walk, Clayton, um, during which he said that he had learned of a sister back in England to whom Clayton was very much attached. Clayton, uh, Clayton acknowledged the friendship, but nothing further than an attachment such as a brother and a sister in the church might rightfully entertain for each other. So he's like, I don't, we're just, we're just friends. The prophet then suggests, why don't you send for her? Clayton replied, in the first place, I have no authority to send for her. And if I had, I have not the means to pay expenses. Joseph Smith says, I give you authority to send for her and I will furnish you the means, which according to Clayton, he did. Noting that this day in early 1843 was the first time the prophet had talked with him on the subject of plural marriage. Clayton recalled the prophet's further sanction. It is your privilege to have all the wives you want. Okay. So, so yeah, so another woman from England who's traveling over to a new place. And then this one's kind of interesting because um, I put a question mark because Joseph Smith is trafficker because this is a, a unique situation where Joseph says as the trafficker in the position that I'm putting him in, he's saying, I give you authority to go and get her and I'll give you money to go and get her. So Joseph is, he's sort of benefiting in a way because he's getting another loyal follower. He's got someone in the inner circle with him who will, will how did you guys say that? like hold his lies close or, or lie with mutually him. assured destruction was Nemo's term. I think. Right. Right. So like something like that. And then, and then William as the buyer. So like, so I guess discussion on whether this was trafficking, um, we can ask that question. It just sort of seems like it to me. And then the, uh, the evidence of, of, uh, of sex, sexual intimacy between Margaret Moon and William Yeah, so they, had, so they had kids together. Yeah, they had six kids. And the first one was born in February of 1844. So again, why would Joseph let his, the 28 people that he selected, why would he allow them to have sex? But he abstained from sex. That doesn't make sense. So, so yeah, they for sure were, they had, they had sex together. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's powerful. Well, I guess that concludes the examples we have of human or sex trafficking that Joseph Smith was involved with, I'm sure that we're not trying to claim that that's all, but the, those are certainly those are certainly many. Um, we do have a few closing slides just to kind of summarize what we're talking about. And uh, this first slide deals with uh, the Nexium cult, Keith Raniere and Allison Mack. So, uh, what were you wanting to say here, Julia? Yeah, so I, I haven't seen your episodes on the Nexium, so I don't really know a whole lot about this, but I do know I did watch all of the Smallville. I was a fan of, of Allison Mack until all this stuff came out that I didn't know. But it's but it says here, let me let me read the quote. So on July 6th of 2023, it was it was posted that a television actor Allison Mack, who pleaded guilty for her role in a sex trafficking case tied to the cult-like group Nexium, has been released from a California prison according to a government website. 
Mac helped prosecutors mount evidence showing how Ranieri created a secret society that included brainwashed women who were branded with his initials and forced to have sex with him. So just wanting to pull in actual cases of sex trafficking, I think is really helpful to see from back then and how we see how it is now. And then also the creating the secret the secret society, which is what Joseph Smith did in the Holy Order and having these women be involved in that as well with polygamy. I just thought that was very similar. So wanted to- Oh, go ahead, Samantha. Well, also feels similar in that um, a lot of the times these these cult leaders will uh, like turn their victims into perpetrators so that, uh, you know, they have more power over them and can't turn on them. So I feel like Alison Mack is a good example of that. Like she was a victim of Keith Raniere, but then she ended up becoming a perpetrator and victimizing these other women. And it feels like Joseph Smith would uh, take certain wives or, or people under his wing and then and, but then they would end up victimizing others and you know they become like pawns in the victimization schemes and i think the jeffrey epstein case is another great example of this do you want to talk us through this julia yeah i don't know how to say her name is it just Lane? so yeah the, i don't know so, okay Gislaine, so just yeah. maxwell the longtime associate of jeffrey epstein was charged on monday this is the an article of, of the new york times she was charged on a Monday for the first time with sex trafficking a minor as federal prosecutors accused her of grooming a 14 year old girl to engage in sexual acts with Mr. Epstein and later paying her. And then with this last slide, I just wanted to change some of the wording to fit this Joseph Smith with human trafficking or with sex trafficking. So if you go to the last slide, I've taken the same article and I've changed some of the wording. So I've, I've made it to say, this is not a real thing, but I've made this to say, Elizabeth Durfee, a longtime associate of Joseph Smith was charged with sex trafficking a 19 year old girl. She was accused of grooming this woman to engage in sexual acts with Mr. Smith with the promise of eternal glory. Yeah, same energy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gives off same uh, vibes. Yeah, that's what that's what I wanted to point to, that they that they're so similar. Okay. Well, I guess I guess we've made our case. Julia, I want to thank you. And of course I know Nemo and, and Samantha provided you with at least some support on this research. But that's, um, that's Julia's case or our case for considering Joseph Smith in the context of human or sex trafficking. I guess I wanna give Nemo and Samantha a chance to provide their assessment. And then Julia, I'll give you maybe the final, the final word. Uh, Nemo, let's have you go first. What are your summative thoughts? It feels like a pretty strong case to me that the, the setup of polygamy was to bring women to america um or even just remove women from their families within america to allow these men to have multiple sexual partners that seems to me to be pretty much what's going on here um and then brigham young turned it almost into an industry uh that the numbers went up and up and up and up so the the idea the trafficking gets more intense with brigham young and it'd be interesting to almost do a follow-up episode examining that um through a similar lens and through a similar structure but i think yeah ulti ultimately polygamy requires more women than these men can often acquire organically and so they have to find them elsewhere and um, they can get brought to them by any number of sources and it's just a horrible thing to realize it's part of the history of the church that i am a member of so nemo you you're saying guilty joseph is guilty of sex or human trafficking by your assessment is that right yeah I'd say so. Samantha, what's your take? Yeah, to me, there's no question that human trafficking was a, a part of early Mormonism. And I guess I just want to echo something I said earlier, which is kind of an obvious point. But, you know, human trafficking is just one type of abuse uh, with like, you know, a specific structure and a way that it happens. And, and this episode has only explored that. And, and I think uh, Julia made a fantastic case for it. But it's like we're not even touching on all the other instances of abuse and child grooming that maybe don't fall quite under the trafficking category. Like the, there's just endless uh, abuse perpetrated against women, children, men. So e even this isn't is only painting one slice of the the picture, and it's it's horrifying on its own. So that it's kind of it's kind of just we're just scratching the surface, right? Right. And yet it's this bad. Yeah. All right, Julia, what's your final, your final summation? 
Yeah, so I know that that um, accusing Joseph of being a sex trafficker is a strong and bold claim, and I feel like I have strong evidence. And for those of you who are listening that disagree, I ask that you do that you disagree with me kindly, and that you disagree with me with sources, because um, I would re I would be interested to know if I am wrong. Then I would I want to know that. However, I think that I think that this evidence shows, and these cases show that Joseph Smith was sex trafficking. And to me, if people dismiss these stories. They're dismissing the they're dismissing the the lives of these women who went through these difficult situations and circumstances. And so just listen to these victims, listen to these women and and then decide. I don't know how else to say that because these women, these stories are so important to tell in church history. I'll, I, I, this isn't me playing devil's advocate, but I am going to represent kind of an orthodox believing mindset. And I'll say two arguments. One is that this is reductionist. Yes, sex was involved, but these people um, believed that they were being led by God, believed that they were being led by the Holy Spirit. And just like, you know, a gay or lesbian Mormons say, don't reduce my marriage to just sex. Our marriage is about much more than sex. It's about doing the dishes together and going on walks and vacationing and emotional intimacy and psychological intimacy. I could hear an Orthodox Mormon saying, stop reducing these marriages to sex. These marriages were about faith. They were about faithfulness. They were about obedience to God. And we were, by the way, we were led by the Holy Ghost to enter into them. So stop your religious bigotry and and reducing everything to sex you dirty ex-mormons uh right. any 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 reaction to that and then i have one final apologetic argument anyone want to respond to that argument first as you were well no, I just want to say, as you were julia speaking, then samantha <laughs> as you were speaking i was i was looking at it through the lens of the flds church with warren jeffs or even uh, this one isn't trafficking but with um, Elizabeth Smart and like, oh, it was these relationships were more than just sex. They were other things. This man was called of God or whatever, whatever. But like, well, leaving that out is a huge thing. And it's an important thing to, to keep in. Th these are these are real victims that have real stories. And I and I'd hate to throw that out completely. Yes, their relationships could be more than that because they are trying to follow God. But to remove that is is doing a very great disservice. Samantha, you, you you had a reaction, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon for victims to be complicit in their own abuse and to to need to find meaning and purpose in it. And and obviously, there's a spectrum of of how um, how much women were willing to speak up about their misery in this system. But also, I don't think Joseph Smith was like doing dishes and having uh, you know, like binge watching shows with these women, like he's going to them, for, you know, that one account where he's with a woman for one night only, like they, they're all secret wives, he's denying it publicly. So they're not, they're not having this like beautiful, uh, I imagine, relationship outside of that. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, everything's always bigger than sex, but, but it does seem primarily sexual, because they're all so secretive he's, he's not allowed to just be like having a day date with them you know it's got to be like in the cover of night in this special room when my wife is for some reason busy that night like they're not there's no space for them to create an actual marriage like it wasn't an actual marriage it, it i mean it literally wasn't because uh you know it was illegal but yeah there, there was no uh space for them to to get to know each other in the way that spouses should be able to get to know each other and I would, I would also say off the back of that, Sam, is when the the active believing Mormon or the, you know, the apologetic comes through, stop making it about sex. DNC 132 yeah, literally makes it about sex. Yeah, it's not it's, us, it's, it's God. not us, it's DNC 132 mm -hmm. that says these polygamous marriages were about having sex and about mm -hmm. bearing children. And it does matter whether sex was involved. Like we're talking about girls as young as 14. Of course, that's going to be... Yep an element that is horrifying to us. Like there are so many victims of sex trafficking that also have like friendships or relationships with their abusers. It's not always this black and white thing as I feel like this episode has outlined, like lines get blurry and a lot of the time victims can be friendly to their abusers and yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm grateful for Patrick Mason. One of the most important things ever said by faithful top Mormon scholar Patrick Mason is, he admitted on Mormon Stories podcast that when he studied Joseph Smith's polygamy, that to him, it looked a lot like sin. 
And I think that's one of the most courageous things ever said by a prominent faithful Mormon on, on Mormon stories. Okay, well, the final argument that I was going to make, we've alluded to it, but I'm just going to make it hardcore, is that God can do what God wants. God's <laughs> ways are higher than man's ways. Isaiah 55 says that. God tells you know Nephi to chop off Laban's head. God tells the Israelites to kill all the, what, I don't know, Philistines or whatever, that's men, women, children, animals, that sometimes God understands things a lot more sophisticatedly than humans do. And that if God is commanding this, then Joseph and all, all the women um, and all the other participants, they're literally just doing God's bidding. And if you're going to be mad at anybody, be mad at God, blame God. But but God can do what God wants because God has infinite wisdom um, and uh, understanding. God can do that. God can do what He wants, but He blessed me with the moral with the as Bedna would call it moral agency, and I will make a moral judgment that God shouldn't have done that. If if that's if that wants to be the argument, you know, you can say yeah, God can do what He wants, and people are free to disagree with God's decisions. And it's hard to believe that an all knowing, loving God would demand things happen that look so much like child abuse and grooming and human trafficking. Like I've said it before, but it's like, it, it, God just has horrible PR senses. If that, if that is like, there's surely better ways to do it, whatever his purposes even were than uh, creating a system that looks exactly like child abuse a lot of the time. Not just a PR problem. God's a monster. If God yeah. is is commanding, and He doesn't, God doesn't. Mormon God doesn't have the power to go to Helen Mark Kimball or to go to you know Sarah. What Sarah Whitney is that her name? To go to Emma. God, Mormon God doesn't have the power to actually tell the women this is what they should do. It's always filtered through Joseph. So why is God's power limited? It would have been so much better if God could have just appeared to all the women and all the men involved and explicitly, as explicitly as Joseph claimed, he and you know God and Jesus told Joseph to start the one true church, as explicitly as Joseph claimed Moroni told Joseph Smith to go find the gold plates. Why didn't God have the power to, or the respect to personally appear to these women and tell them what he wanted them to do? Why did he require Joseph, um, you know, someone with a vested interest, someone with a dual, um, a dual, you know, interest in this relationship? Why was it Joseph who always had to communicate, um, you know, God's will to these women? So I just, I, I just defy anyone to tell me what is the meaningful difference you know, between David Koresh, Keith Raniere, Warren Jeffs, Jim Jones, Marshall Applewhite, pick your cult leader, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, David Miscovich. Tell me the meaningful difference between any of those cult leaders and Joseph Smith's behavior. And in all of those cases, it's God that becomes the monster. And I just want to ask the Orthodox Mormon, do you want to believe in that type of God, the Mormon God? Because God is the ultimate scapegoat because he's unquestionable. These men can turn around and say, well, God made me do it. And no one can turn around and go and ask God if he did or not. Can't it's prove it's a almost negative. as simple as that, right? You can't prove that. Exactly. Yeah. You can't prove a negative. Were we getting snaps from you, Samantha? I thought you, yeah, you made an amazing point just then. I love it. Why would God need it to look exactly like exploitation, exactly out of the same playbook as every other cult leader who abused women and children? Bit suspicious. Feels like he could have done it a different way. And, it, and of course, a, an apologetic Mormon is going to say, well, that's the trial of the faith, right? That's the Abrahamic test, right? That the God requires an Abrahamic sacrifice like unto Abraham having to kill his son Isaac. Of but course, God's going to require of us all an Abrahamic test, right? But the key difference there is that God went, oh, yeah, but here's a, an innocent animal you can slaughter instead. I mean, it's a whole different problem. But, you know, no one thinks of the ram, do they? Um, but Samantha, God didn't Samantha actually, thinks of the ram. Thinks we know Samantha, Samantha thinks of the ram. We're, we're going peak vegan tonight, guys. <laughs> um, but the, the actual issue really is that God said, right, okay, don't actually kill your son. Whereas God said, oh, no, actually do hand over your 14-year-old to Joseph Smith. So there's no Abrahamic test of faith here. God could 
God could have done an Abrahamic test of faith and then found out that Heber C. Kimball was willing and then said, but you don't actually have to. But no, it happened. Yeah. And let's say someone fails the test of faith because they're like, this looks exactly like child grooming and human trafficking and I'm not okay with that. What kind of all loving God would count that against you? Like, oh, this homo sapiens who I have endowed with reason and the, you know, the ability to think critically has looked at this, compared it to other situations of abuse and grooming and exploitation, determined that it looks exactly the same and is morally repulsed by that and therefore has stepped away from Joseph Smith and this organization. Like how could a loving all knowing God have any well, beef with you for that? They're like, that's a strong moral code. Why because, would you want the people that are willing to stand idly by while racism and child grooming and human trafficking is happening? Because like, oh, God said so. Because unfortunately, within that God's paradigm, that isn't the moral position. Right. The moral position justifies Obedience child first. grooming and uh, and all these bad things to happen because God does, in, in these scriptures, justifies the murder of a man who can't defend himself so that his clothes can be stolen. Mm -hmm. Um you know, and, and plates can be taken and, and all these sorts of things. So the, the, the answer to that argument, I guess, um, Sam, would be that we view it as a moral position, but God doesn't necessarily view it as a moral position. So he wouldn't applaud you for having coming to that conclusion because yeah. the conclusion didn't come from him saying so. Bit of a narcissist. A little bit. Yeah, Mormon, so many people, you know, I'm often asked, why do so many ex, you know, Mormons leave Mormonism and stop believing in God and Jesus altogether. It's it's because Mormon history, Mormon doctrine, Mormon theology ruins God and Jesus for so many people, I think. Yeah, and the same uh, critical thinking skills that get you out of Mormonism can get you out of Christianity too. The Bible is an ethical nightmare yeah. and an ahistorical nightmare. <laughs> But more, Mormon God is particularly problematic. I mean, he takes Old Testament. He, he It's weird because Mormon God is supposed to be Jesus. And yet Mormon God is about as Old Testament of an unethical God as you, as you could experience. It's, it's weirdly like when Jesus is down here in a body and having to suffer like the rest of us, he's all nice and kind and compassionate yeah. and be nice to everyone. But, but the moment he's up in the clouds and he's yeah. got his, you know, his distance between us, he just becomes pretty vindictive. Up in his ivory tower. He's yeah, so cool. right. So when he's down with the plebs, he, he's all like, yeah. oh, be nice to each other because, you know, he wants people to be nice to him too. Uh, but yeah. When he's up yeah. in the ivory tower, exactly, Sam, he just smites people and he's like, oh, well, no, go do this. You know, go and traffic a 14-year-old, thus saith me. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. going to kill all the firstborn children in a country just because I want you to, to give special privilege to a group of my people that you're not being very nice to. I'll shout out a quick comment. Uh, Coco B writes, John, your podcast yesterday was excellent. Um, love the idea. Go big love. Uh, we interviewed a, a woman named Celeste who talked about... Um, uh, you know, losing uh, the Mormon God and then sort of discovering her own God. Her name was Celeste Davis. But that's a that's a really profound episode. It's not as uh, salacious as, you know, this episode about Joseph Smith and sex trafficking. But if you want to hear someone uh, explore the idea of a God that's more palatable or of a spirituality that's more powerful, I recommend my two-part series with Celeste Davis. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this has been an amazing panel. We were able to do it in around three hours instead of four. I commend us all for our discipline. Um, I want to give everyone a chance to kind of plug whatever it is that they want to plug because, you know, we, we really appreciate other contributors and it's a priority on Mormon Stories to support the work of other contributors. So, Sammy, please plug both your life coaching work and Zelf on the Shelf. Shamelessly plug it, Sam. Shamelessly <laughs> plug. Yeah, so I am a faith transitions coach. If you're interested in that, you can go to samanthashellycoaching.com. And that's Shelly with an E-Y, Samantha e Shelly with an E-Y. Yeah. E you can also find me on Instagram at the Sam Spo, and all my links are there. Um, I co-host Self on the Shelf on YouTube. You should definitely check us out and subscribe. And we also have a community on Patreon of about 700 people, which is just a nice, like, more insular community where we can uh, support each other. And me and Tana read 80s Mormon fiction there every week. So it's a really good time. All right, Samantha, it's so great to have you back. I hope you'll come back again. Okay, you know we definitely. adore you. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, Nemo, tell us about Nemo the Mormon and well, how they can support you. 
first, if you like the me, John, and Sam energy, you should definitely check out a video on Zelf on the Shelf's channel, which is us roasting John Delin. I it's just want to give one of the best videos that has ever existed in the X Woman space. I don't say that lightly. I, 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 when I'm feeling yeah. down, I watch that video because I just think the vibes are immaculate. It's so funny. John There's is a lot like of people. most unhinged. You don't know John Dillon until you've watched that video. So many people have come back to me and said, like, that's my comfort watch, you know? Like, it is. I, I go back and watch it and it, it cheers me up. So definitely uh -huh. go check that video out. Um, Roasting John Dillon on the Zelf on the Shelf channel. Yeah, it's it's excellent. I never thought I'd have Tanner Gillen sat on my lap, but there we are. <laughs> um, you know? <laughs> That Immaculate happened. Sausage. Immaculate Sausage will Nemo's be the name band. of my band one day. <laughs> anyway, so uh, what I'm doing, um, I'm also having a bit of humor this week. In the past couple of weeks, I've talked about the LDS temples, you know, who builds them, who's profiting off building them. Um, are they being built to a sufficient quality? You know, we looked at the temples that got torn down in the east of the US because there was rampant mold problems within 20 years. Because uh, someone in Utah went, oh, well, we'll just design them like we design them here. But what works in a desert doesn't work in a swamp. So uh, mold problems were, were rampant. But this week, I'm, I'm lightening the tone a little bit and, and asking the question, what would happen if you furnished temples with IKEA furniture? Um, and it's, it's going to be a wonderful ride. We'll have a great time. <laughs> uh so come and look at the youtube uh and yeah just come over join the join the community we i i generally do kind of investigative journalism type pieces on mormonism so i'll look into a topic and there'll be sources the description is always like 90 percent source material so you can come there and just have a great time and and i'm also on the lds discussion series on mormon stories podcast which i love being involved with and can't wait to do more of in the fall. And Nemo, yeah. how do people donate to you if they want to financially uh, support your work? So it's donorbox.org forward slash Nemo the Mormon. Pretty simple. And they can just become a monthly donor yeah, and yeah. in that yeah. way financially mm -hmm. support you because you're always you're trying to do this full time, right? Oh, I am doing this full time. Yeah. You know? um, so it is it is my full time job, as it were, uh, which I love. I really enjoy. Um, but, you know, any anything people can do to help make that more stable is always appreciated. Beautiful. All right, Julia, tell us about your amazing platform and your offerings. Yeah, so I have um, a TikTok, a YouTube, and an Instagram, and a website, the analyzingmormonism.com. And there's various donate buttons if, if you're interested. I don't, I just do all this in my spare time. I don't, I don't get paid for any of it unless someone pays me or sends me some money. But, um, but also we have the Adina Publishers website. Our submissions are closed. Um, until the fall, so because we're working on publishing some. But if you go to the bottom of adinapublishers.com, you'll see our Mormon Studies um, books that we're publishing. We have William Smith's book out already. It's on audio. It's on Amazon. Um, I don't. I think we're struggling with our printers to get it up there. But um, but if you can reach out to me if you were interested in a copy, and then our Nova Expositor will be available soon with the audio as well. Show so it. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there I, it so, yeah. is. Yeah. All right, yep. so you can read the Nauvoo Expositor and put nice. it on your shelf and, and yep. underline it and mark it up. Goes to get yep. me a copy of that. Yeah. And just to describe again the concept of Adina Publishers real quick. Oh, so Adina Publishers, our focus is to um, bring more um, LGBTQ uh, affirming books into the world. And so that's what we're focusing on, just anything science fiction, you know, history, I don't know, anything that's under that umbrella. Um, as long as they have queer characters or good representatives. So that's what we're interested in publishing. Um, you can see all the on our website, all of what we're interested in. And so, yeah, so that's our main focus. But our as a side thing, we're publishing out of print Mormon books that. Yeah, so we have we've got the novel release study minute book. We have John uh, John D. Lee's uh, Mormonism Unveiled. We have wife number 19 that we're working on. We've, we've just got a lot of stuff coming. So. Beautiful. All right. We'll keep up the good work, Julia. And again, thanks for your research for today's episode. We hope to have you back. And thanks to Samantha and Nemo for the, all the assists. I think today was a great panel, so we did good work. Yeah. Good job, yeah. Congratulatory claps. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, thanks to Maven for moderating the comments and always doing the time codes and show notes. We really appreciate all the work that Maven does. Gerardo for the thumbnails, Brooklyn for the video editing, and of course the Open Stories Foundation board, um, Clint Martin and, and Carrie Whitbeck, they keep us alive and keep us functioning. Thanks to all our viewers. Uh, thanks to all the commenters. Thanks to everyone who donated through the Super Chat features today. 
Um, I forgot to mention one, Leaders writes, big thanks to all you creators. I really think conservative religious America would have been in tolerance of Mormonism if they knew this early history. Um, thanks to everyone who donated through the Super Chat features today. Also, I just want to thank our rank and file donors, those who go to mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button to become monthly donors. That sustainable monthly revenue is what allows us to hire staff reliably and to keep them employed. So whether it's Julia or Nemo or John Larson or um, Brooklyn or Gerardo or uh, Margie or uh, all the different people that get paid monthly through the Open Stories Foundation, we're able to do that because we have monthly recurring donations that allow us to bring people on to work. So if you uh, value this content, you're not a donor, and if you want to see it continue, all you got to do is go to mormonstories.org, click on the donor button, sign up for a monthly donation. Uh, we're transparent in our finances. We release our 990s every year as we're required. We do our best to provide you with as much transparency as we can about what we're doing, and we do our best to make sure that, that all the money that you donate goes to staff, goes to computers, goes to machines, equipment, uh, internet, broadband, you know, whatever it is that we do, we try and just make sure that your money is efficiently spent um, to promote the cause, which is to promote uh, informed consent within Mormonism, to educate Mormons and the rest of the world about Mormon history, Mormon doctrine, Mormon theology, and then to support Mormons in faith crisis and to support those who decide they need to leave the church. And now, we're surprised to learn that over half of our YouTube audience has never been Mormon. We're not just supporting Mormons and ex-Mormons. We're supporting the ex-Jehovah's Witness community, Scientology, Evangelical Christianity, Catholic, um, Episcopalian, uh, Orthodox Jew. We're, we're supporting so many different faith traditions um, as well as the secular community and understanding their lives better. Because I believe that the Mormon story is the human story in in so many ways. So thanks to everyone again for today. Join us again next time for another episode. Check out our very important interview with Radio Free Mormon that destroys any speculation as to whether or not Joseph practiced polygamy. He absolutely did. And check out the Mormon uh, stories episode coming soon with Radio Free Mormon about that, as well as Mormonism Live and Radio Free Mormon podcasts. And uh, just all the things. Love you guys. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. And we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody.